Ready? Okay, it is now 6.02, calling the order. Uh, Trophy Club One uh, special meeting, workshop session. Uh, we have a quorum. We have all five directors here, Director Chapman, direct, Director Flynn, Director Cassaway, Director Rose, and myself. Uh, citizen comments. There's an opportunity for citizens to address the board on any matter, whether or not it's posted on the agenda. The board is not permitted to take action or discuss any presentation made to the board at this time concerning an item not listed on the agenda. The board will hear the presentations. Will hear presentation on specific agenda items prior to the board addressing them. You may speak up to three minutes or the time limit determined by the president or presiding officer. I have noticed that we have one citizen comment, uh, Ms. Baker. Okay, please uh, step to the podium, announce your name and your address, and then you okay. may begin. Okay, thank you. Um, well, welcome new board members and, and previous board members. Um, glad to see you guys all here. Um, I've, um, my name is Joyce Baker, and my address is 1801 Seville Cove, uh, Westlake, and I live in the neighborhood of Granada. And I've um, come before the, the previous board several times, and I just wanted to... Uh, get a chance to speak to all the board members, the new board members, and I'm, I'm hopeful that you guys can address a problem um, that's involving Westlake in, soon <laughs> and maybe get it on the next agenda. But um, I don't know if you're familiar, but in where Granada is in the old Solana area, it used, I think it used to be commercial, now it's residential, and our water is provided by Westlake, but yet we're being taxed by um, Trophy Club Mud. So every, we have 84 homes in our neighborhood, and every one of them is paying thousands of dollars every month, uh, every month, every year. Oh, God, if it was every month. Um, <laughs> every year, and it's just unfair because we're not even getting any of the services of the mud. So I am just wanted to make sure you guys, was, guys were aware and see what options. I know you last the last board had explored several different op options, and one of which you know, maybe de-annexing Westlake or, or the people in Westlake that don't belong, get any services from the mud. Um, there was years ago some negotiation with um, the town of Trophy Club and Westlake to maybe Westlake buy out part of it. So I just wanted to ask that you guys make that a priority because um, it's just not fair and it's um, since we don't get any services from Trophy Club. Can you tell me if that's being considered? I know you're not allowed to dis discuss it. Is I know I see on the agenda the debt structure, and I know there are some bonds that are outstanding that I think are going to expire in 2020, 2021, maybe the last one, but I'm I hoping that... I think it's 2022. Okay. Or that's the first callable date for outstanding okay. general obligation bonds. Yeah, so I'm hoping that one of the things you guys are going to look at is maybe calling some of those old ones that are out there. And my understanding is that since there's two towns, somehow with two towns being involved and the mud being in the middle, like if, if Trophy Club owned the mud, the, if the town owned the mud, I think, then Westlake could get out of it. It would be easier for it to get out of it if the mud wasn't kind of in the middle. But I don't, I don't you guys probably know, you two probably know more about it than anybody <laughs> up there. So that's, that's all I have to say. I'm just hoping you guys consider it and I would like to see it on the board meeting or, or get some communication from you guys on addressing that problem. Thank you, ma'am, for okay. coming to speak. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, first item on the agenda is a overview of district facility services and operations. General Manager Carmen, please begin. Please pre begin. Thank you, Mr. President. Maybe just a couple of housekeeping notes, if I could. Um, if you could give me a reminder, I do have a brevity impairment, and um, if you could give me a reminder about 7.45, that that's where we are, because I can't really see a clock from here. Um, we have, um, I'd like to take a little break right around 8, and we have a scheduled um, phone call with our construction litigation attorney sometime between 8 and 8.15, just a 15-minute briefing and closed session. Okay. So we'd want to go to closed session right after a, a bathroom break. Um, so we can just jump to that part of the agenda when we get there if I'm not there yet. So hopefully um, we'll get everybody out of here before 10 o'clock. Um, 
in your packets, I want to bring some things to your attention. Lori's done a great job of putting together some reference material for you all we felt was important. Um, first off, there's a budget document. It's the big format, um, uh, widespread piece of paper. Even as such, it's large. When you get back into some of the back pages, there are spreadsheets that you cannot read. They're just too small. That's um, the way life goes. Um, there's also key contracts in there. So I want to bring to your attention that um, inside of the three ring binder, there's a copy of the Fort Worth wholesale water contract, which is one of our biggest cost drivers. Nearly 30% of our money goes to Fort Worth to pay for wholesale water every year. Uh, it includes um, the agreement between the PID and the MUD for wholesale water supply, as well as the first amendment for that. So those are key contracts that uh, drive our operations. Um, it includes the interlocal cooperation agreement between the, the town and the MUD for the administration of fire, uh, fire services. Um, and it also includes a copy of your own uh, bylaws for the board of directors, which really governs how you, um, you know, direct the staff um, to do their work. Now, um, you know, uh, I sense that this board is more tech savvy than um, our last ones, and um, we've included within that book um, just a little memory key that has all those documents um, on a memory key, so if you don't want to lug around your uh, three-ring binder, um, I understand. But um, sometimes it's hard to search in PDF documents for things, and um, you know, it's helpful to have a hard copy. Um, I like reading hard copies because I'm getting older and my eyesight is not as good as it used to be. So um, we're going to refer to some of these documents as we go along, but um, I do appreciate Lori's effort in helping to get those out. Okay, so our agenda for today um, is to look at an overview of facilities, services, and operations, an overview of the district organization and personnel matters. Um, we're going to um, turn to an overview of district finances. Uh, following that, we're going to take a look at, um, it's really just our draft five-year CIP, which of all the things that go up and down and change, the big drivers for next year's budget is really related to capital spending. And so I wanted to at least put our draft up. We're not ready to really talk about the FY 18-19 uh, budget yet, so this is early in the process. But um, our hope is to familiarize you with the budgets that we have kind of go through that and answer any questions that we have. Again, um, if you want to interrupt me and ask a question while we're going, I'm, I'm more than happy to do it. I appreciate your help in restraining my brevity impairment um, in my answers. <laughs> and we can get out of here at a decent time. Okay, let's see. Um, we'll move on to district goals and priorities. You know, for me, um, I'm going to tell you what my priorities are. Um, but um, certainly there's an area for um, the board to discuss its own goals and priorities. Um, I know Director Flynn had talked about the possibility of a town hall meeting, and we can have hopefully have a little time for a discussion of that. Any other parting thoughts that you might have? Okay. Um, for a system overview, I just want to take some time. It could go um, could go a while, um, but to talk about a basic system overview, um, starting with you know what are our water sources? How do we get them? Um, what are the assets that we have to move them to where they need to be? Um, that would include elevated storage, water distribution assets, and metering, which um, is a key part of our overall revenue process. I mean, we've got to meter the water to get where we want to be. Um, and then after it goes through a house, some portion of that water will go into the sewer system, um, the stuff that didn't show up in a leak or um, go down, um, uh, go to irrigation. Uh, we'll talk about um, lift stations and then um, uh, what happens in the sewer treatment facility. Um, I apologize for um, my lack of graphic design capability, <laughs> and many of these graphics are um, and just copied from other people's websites. But let's start with Tarrant Regional Water District Supply System. Um, Tarrant Regional Water District is formed under um, state code, state legislation. And they have um, four primary customers. Um, they serve water to Fort Worth, the largest one, but also to Arlington, Mansfield, and a small portion of their water comes to TRA. Now, this water is all raw water, okay? 
And whether it's a drop of rain that falls in the basin that we're looking at, starting at Lake Bridgeport down the Trinity River um, through those reservoir systems, or whether it falls in East Texas or downriver on the Trinity and is pumped back up into our watershed, mm. um, every drop of water they bill Fort Worth for, at least the ones that they sell to Fort Worth, and Fort Worth passed those costs along to us. That's kind of the, the pass-through piece. Now, Fort Worth treats it. They have treatment facilities, and we can take a look at that. So um, there's, you know, basically starting at Lake Bridgeport, they don't really have a way to put water in Bridgeport, but they do have a way to get water into Eagle Mountain. And so they can control releases from Lake Bridgeport um, and fill up Eagle Mountain with their supply system from out in East Dallas or um, East Texas. Now, um, that tr consumes a tremendous amount of electrical power when you think about what it takes to pump that water all the way over here. And when I first came to Texas in 2015, y'all had been in a drought of significant consequence. And of course, um, like I've done in other states in the country, um, I was a cold, wet blanket on the revenue stream of the district because I'm um, in a drought. We put restrictions in place. And um, so um, I showed up, and 2015 was the wettest year on record. Um, that's just the way it worked. Um, starting in April, it was the wettest year on record. And the next year was a top 10 wet year. There's a lot of water that fell. Um, a lot of the old timers on the Tarrant Regional Water District Board told me they had never seen all of the reservoirs in the system from Lake Bridgeport down to Richland Chambers full at the same time. They had never seen that. Well, that year, um, the budgeted money to pump all that water from East Texas wasn't spent, and the end of the year true up. So the agreement between Tarrant Regional Water District and Fort Worth and the other four big customers is we're going to estimate how much water you're going to use. We're going to estimate how much money it's going to cost us to pump that up there. And then we have a true up bill at the end of the year. So um, if we missed it, you know, and you owe more, then you have to pay. And that's, that's a, a budgetary risk that Fort Worth takes on our behalf to some extent. And um, they pass that uh, along in one fashion or another. Um, they're certainly not, um, but they're going to make us pay for that electrical cost one way or the other. Um, there's um, a couple of big system improvements going on at Terra Regional. Uh, one is called the IPL. Um, it's the, uh, I forget what the I stands for, but it's the uh, interconnecting pipeline to those reservoirs. It's a one and a half billion dollar project. Um, as a part of getting state funding for that project, it's a, I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, to get that state funding for the project, they had to show that they were following conservation guidelines and state code. And um, as a result of that, when we um, have someone concerned about their, their water bill, um, we have a service available to them that's, um, I forget what the new name of those guys are, but they are willing to come out and do an irrigation audit for your system. Um, I'm told that Trophy Club is number one on the list in terms of people who have asked for audits of their irrigation system. Um, so I'm proud of that. I think um, it's a good thing our folks that... Uh, talk to people with bill concerns, have been referring them to that. But ultimately, that's being paid for by Tarrant Regional Water District for all of the customers within their service area um, in an effort to maintain their funding status with um, the state agencies. So that's, that's kind of how that starts off. Um, so, you know, Fort Worth has 30 wholesale water customers. And, of course, 850,000 citizens of their own. So their system is very large. I put it top 12 in the country. A very large system, and we are a small piece of that overall. Let's see, what else did I want to say on here? That might do it. Again, the, some of the water comes down the Trinity, and they have a way to pull that water off here near Cedar Creek Reservoir and actually pump it back up. So it's effectively recycling river water um, by putting some electrical money into it it's, and significant electrical money. Okay, so um, more than 90% of our water comes from Fort Worth. Um, this is kind of a, it's um, clipped out of a Google Maps picture. So let me see if I can move the cursor. If we look right here on the 377, 
Um, there's a delivery point there um, for both Westlake and for uh, Trophy Club. Um, there's a 21 inch pipeline that extends from there. This mouse is kind of shaky, or maybe I'm kind of shaky. Where did it go? Did my mouse just die? There it is. Okay, come here. So our 21 inch pipeline extends from here along I guess that's the 377. It takes a right-hand turn and comes along the south edge of the 170. Comes all the way up to here. And then right about in this area, it crosses under the 114 and comes directly across the street into that newly fenced area, which is our metering station for Fort Worth Water. That's, well, I guess we paid for it, but it's owned by Fort Worth, is my understanding. And they come out and read those meters um, once a month and finally did some uh, fencing repairs. That fence blew right off the wall um, during, earlier this year. Um, so that's how that um, water gets to, the, to us. Um, that water is treated, and the bulk of it is treated at the Eagle Mountain Water Treatment Plant. That's one of um, Fort Worth's large plants. But with the new north side distribution system, there is the possibility of getting water from other of their plants. They have five different water treatment plants and something on the order of five or 600 million gallons a day in treatment capacity. So this is our um, critical lifeline. 90% of our water comes through that. Um, at one point in time, there was an agreement, um, at least contemplated with Westlake, that they would um, take some water off of our pipeline and supply their area. I'm not sure that um, they ever used that contract, but I th think I found a copy of it executed back in the files. Also, at one point in time, uh, Roanoke had their delivery point. They are also wholesale customers of Fort Worth. Um, off of that line, somewhere in this area, um, they have since relocated their meter station, the, the one that's operated by Fort Worth, to a different location in their city. Um, so it's my understanding that line is capped off, but I'm really not sure when that happened and uh, whether or not there's just a valve that's been closed or whether it was actually capped off. Um, if this is representing more than 90% of our water supply, it really becomes a single point of failure in our system. I mean, there's really no other way to look at that. If we, if we lost it and we could only get, you know, 8% of the water that we'd normally get in August um, for uh, we'd have to cut off all outside irrigation and, um, and go with that until we could get that line fixed and repaired. So um, it is a, a critical piece of asset. Um, right now, um, it's in Westlake. So um, when somebody digs um, a hole in the Town of Trophy Club, their planning and zoning folks will give us a call and tell us, hey, if somebody's going to dig a hole, go out there and mark your utilities. Since this line is in Westlake, um, we do not get the same consideration. So I just I put that on there because one of my priorities shows up later is related to um, location of underground assets and protecting the assets that we have. Okay, so again, um, it's a lot of fun reading, but we I think last year's budget, if you look in the document under water purchases, we paid or we budgeted about or for this fiscal year, $2.8 million to buy water from Fort Worth. So it's 2.8. Um, I had last month's bill in my hand. Um, Stephen gave me a copy of their invoice. And um, so it was like $220,000. Um, the first 40000 of that um, had to do with peaking capacity. So 40% um, of it relates to how they calculate peaking capacity <coughs> in those contracts. So you know, even if we didn't use a drop, we'd be paying you know, forty grand a month or what could effectively be eight hundred thousand dollars a year, or sorry, four hundred eighty thousand dollars a year, uh, for that, um, and it's you know certainly a place where we could talk about um, well, if we build a third ground storage tank, and we could shave those peaks off, um, how long would it take to pay for itself? Just as a general notion, um, we also get water from uh, four wells in the system, so we have four operating wells. Um, three of these wells are in the Paluxy Aquifer, um, which is a shallower aquifer, and we have one well in the deeper Trinity Aquifer. Uh, it's my understanding, talking to Mike, that um, the Trinity Aquifer is characterized by high chloride levels, and that um, 
Uh, back in the day, that was actually a, a well drilled by um, the golf course to supply them, but high chlorides tend to be hard on greens and to, to a lesser extent fairways. So um, ironically, it's not harmful for humans as long as we keep it not corrosive. Um, so um, that became a part of our system. And of course, it's heavily diluted with our Fort Worth water contract. Um, so, Carmen, is that still an operational well then? Yes. Okay. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but that one is over here in the water yard. Correct. So we have, two, we have this well that we're looking at in the picture is actually on the 114 frontage road just past the Tom Thumb going west. Um, we have two in the yard over here that pump into our tanks. So we'll get to that in a second. And then the, the final one, I've, I don't have the numbering in my head, but this one says number four. The other one is just on this side of the playground that's behind Tom Thumb in a little neighborhood. Um, so it's between the houses and the backyard. And I've got pictures of it, but I didn't want to just you know, put up pictures of all the wellheads. It's not that exciting. Um, the water in these aquifers are managed by the North Texas Groundwater Conservation District. Those conservation districts were created in state law during the drought um, period, maybe the one before the last one, actually, because I think this one might have been formed in 11. I guess that could have been the start of the drought, but groundwater tables tend to recede in drought periods, and um, they recover slowly because it takes time for that water to trickle through into the aquifer. Uh, we pay a fee to North Texas for the water that we um, take out of the ground. Um, this is important because when you look at some of the documents that are important to us, um, for example, a bond covenant or the Regency planning document for the state of Texas, they're all suggesting that we're going to quit using groundwater in 2022. Um, right now, the wells are working fine, and I personally don't see a reason to do that. Um, and there's a request in for the next version of the statewide water plan asking us if we're still going to go through with that. Um, so I'm going to try to answer that um, with a no, because I think that's going to be the appropriate answer. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense to turn away one of your water sources um, until there's a challenge. Now, if we had to, you know, let's say the groundwater table receded below the wellhead and we had to redrill it, um, then there'd be a significant cost consideration there, so the life cycle cost. But right now, it's a, a small but important part of our overall water supply plan. Okay. Okay, so this is a bad old picture. Google hasn't updated this um, overhead for a while. Uh, Mike has got the yard cleaned up really well, so all of this junk that was stored over here is gone. And, of course, the town is in a brand-new town hall, and the parking lot looks a lot emptier these days uh, when you come in. Um, but basically, the groundwater all comes to this site. Um, it's, uh, we call it the water plant, but it's effectively groundwater storage and pumping with a little bit of chemical addition. Okay, so um, the groundwater has to have some chlorine and ammonia added to it to make chloramines. Um, that happens here right behind the tank, you can't see it. But all the water from the wells comes into this, to these tanks, and the water that comes through this meter station right here comes into the tanks as well. Uh, from there, uh, the water is pumped with these light blue pumping stations to our elevated storage tanks. Um, before we get off of this, um, later on when we talk about next year's budget priorities, I just draw your attention to the beautiful look of this fence in the backyard <laughs> and the kind of ugly look here. I know it's, um, it's a satellite image, but um, we think that we need to replace that fence. It's, um, there's holes in it. It's got issues. Um, Mike has put together, well, the town, uh, city just came in, Fort Worth came and replaced this fence. You can kind of see it out the window although they haven't stained it yet. When you look at this one, um, it was stained this nice, beautiful color, and that helps preserve the fence and keep it intact for a period of time. When I was driving out the other day, I looked back into this lady over here's yard, and you can see sprinkler patterns <laughs> on the fence. So they periodically need to be stained as a part of overall maintenance. I believe the budget um, that Mike got an estimate for was over $100,000. To stain the fence? To build the new fence and then stain all of it. 
exactly when do we add our treatment to the water? Because we get water in from the bottom of that picture from Fort Worth, mm -hmm. and we're bringing the well water in and blending it, or do we just add it into the tanks, or do we blend it as it goes out, or how, do you, how, you, how does that work? We blend both of them, so at the top, everything's top filled from those tanks. Fort Worth water's coming in the same time as well water. So you blend it going into the tank? Going, coming into the tank. And when do you water. treat? We have some pre-treatment coming in okay. with that water, so we'll actually dump some chlorine in our well water. It's coming in and mixing with that Fort Worth create a reaction right then and then okay. if we need some ammonia or something we'll add that too okay so the treatment then is going into the tank into the tank and then also we have we call that our pre-chlorination okay. spot when the pumps come on and everything we also have some post chlorination if we okay. need to also okay. okay thank you so this pumping array and we've talked about this a little bit this year um, there's a project on this year's budget to put a new vfd variable frequency drive on one of these motors um, to help us pacing the pumping to the two elevated storage tanks that's been put off until we get out of the high flow season and we can put it back out for bid the bids came in well over our budgeted amount um, but this pumping array effectively pumps to our two elevated storage tanks Carmen, I'm sorry. Can we go back to your quote on the hundred thousand dollars? The f that's to replace the fence, obviously. To replace the, the part of the fence that wasn't new. So this is all new through here within five years, maybe mm, seven. Maybe five. It may be five years old. Um, this stuff out in front. I mean, I park right here, and there's a big hole <laughs> through the fence right there. So um, I think we had a call the other day at the front desk. Somebody thought their dog had gotten into the water area. And, um, and they asked us to go out. Didn't you go out and look at that? Somebody went out. I don't know if we found it or not, but they were concerned that their dog had made it in there. Yeah. So just with your arrow, show me where that would start and end that, that, that comes to 100000 Well, Michael will have to um, help me with that, but it would start over here right at this corner because this newer fence comes around right to Municipal Drive. But all of this is older fence. This part right here was just replaced. I don't know if they did the back, though. They did do the back. They did the back. Okay, and then all of this along this boundary over to here, and then I'm presuming that this is all old as well. Yeah, that's we probably won't replace that. That's chain link. It's all chain link. Yeah, and it's backed up to the... Uh, that wouldn't have been part of the quote of the 100,000? So it's really the whole frontage area? Mm -hmm. The whole front. And, and, and restaining the relatively new fence on both sides. Okay. The, the one, as we look at look at that particular project, one of the things we want to make sure is that we wind up meeting the state code on fencing. Yep. And even if it involves reworking that chain link. I hear you. Um, well, if I could just, on that note, go back. Um, I'm going to show you. Whoops. There we go. Um, so if you look at this around, I, I see this every time I drove over to Ro drive over to Roanoke and get lunch. This fence on the back side is tilted over like this. We have just some basic fencing repairs to do, and we're currently interacting with some folks over on the other side of the freeway that are working on a fencing arrangement around um, a metering station. Um, they have a style that's wrought iron. It, you can see through it, it looks pretty well, but it's nicer than chain link. Um, so I look at this and I think, well, this is a rusty old barbed wire enclosed um, enclosure right in front of a pretty nice looking sound wall um, you know do we really want to just replace it or do we look at maybe upgrading the standard on those a little bit when we do as a general note okay so again from here the water is pumped through some arrangement of these guys right here up to the two elevated storage tanks so there are two uh, the one on the left is owned by the PID it has, or by the town, I guess, effectively, the, um, it has 400,000 gallons of capacity. Uh, the one on the right is down by Town Hall, and it's the MUDS tank. Both of them have the same overflow elevation. So when the water comes out of that pumping arrangement on the other side, it pumps to both tanks, and they have the same sort of, they're supposed to have the same level as the water goes up and down. Just, I just want to clarify one thing. I think that the, the 
tank that we own is 400, and the one that the PID tank's 500,000. It's a larger tank. I had them backwards. I only heard one number, but go ahead. I know one's 400, one's 500, and I had it printed out. So if I got them backwards, my apologies. Um, to some extent, that's designed for fire flow requirements, right? When you design an elevated storage tank, the pressure coming out of a fire hydrant or someone's sink is related to the elevation of the water in either one of those tanks and the elevation where the output is. Um, so if you're at the top of a hill, you're not going to get as much pressure as if you're at the bottom of a hill. Um, these two tanks provide all the pressure on fire hydrants and in hat homes, um, sprinkler systems throughout the town of Trophy Club and um, the Solana area that we also serve. Um, let me ask you to go back to that for a second. There's a couple more items. The, um, so in terms of elevated storage, um, we do have a, a problem that we're trying to resolve. So um, the pipeline that we have that goes to the eastern storage tank um, pretty much runs currently down Indian Creek and then cuts through there, has a bunch of taps off of it. So like Hogan's Glen was added off of that line. It's a 10 inch connection off of there. Um, that came along long after the original pipeline was put in, as I understand it, that 10 inch connection. Um, and hydraulically, it works during most of the time, but when we get into the high parts of the summer, now that we're almost built out, um, we pump into a common sort of pressure and it feeds both tanks. The capacity to the western tank is much larger and it had to be constructed with a valve that shut it off before it overflowed in order to force more water over to the um, eastern tank. Um, we have a project under design right now and we'll get an update on that next Monday to build a 16 inch interconnecting pipeline between our pumping arrangement down through um, PD30 um, and then on part of the frontage road back through some new easements that we'll have to acquire and up to the tank to provide that additional capacity so that both tanks can truly float on the head coming out of that pumping array. Um, that's important that you know it, it distributes equally and um, would save a lot of effort um, on that side. Okay. Um, Someone asked me, well, do they even know how metering works? So, um, you know, we have meters in the system. There's um, something on the order of 4,500 connections. Um, and we have some newer meters and we have some older ones. The technology is improving um, these days. So uh, on two consecutive days at the end of every month, most of them are read on one day. But um, we go out for two days in a row. It's, we mark it on the calendar every month and say, these are the days we're going to read. Um, we go out and read the system. So they have a computer and a truck that picks up wireless signals from these meters and records it um, with the, an account ID. And that is downloaded into our billing system where the reading on these meters is calculated. The newer meters have an additional capability in that they can record hourly water usage during the day. So if people have and we've had incidents where customers have come in and said, I, I can't be watering that much. And we can show them that, well, you're, you know, you're actually set up to come on three times at night. You're just not noticing the, the other part of your sprinkler runs and been able to say, hey, you, know, you, can, you can optimize this watering strategy and it would help you. So that's been very helpful in giving customers feedback on what their actual water usage is. It also allows us to say, well, geez, in the middle of the night, you've got a steady flow of water. It's there every day. That's probably a leak. And um, in those cases, we can help people uh, discover their leaks as well. Um, is that, um, so we just got a bill or a notice in the mail saying we might have a leak. Is that, did that happen in June, if it was dated Ju in June? I don't know. That's yeah, okay, so what that card means, we send those out just kind of as a courtesy, let people know that they might have a leak. What that means is whenever they read your meter, could have been 8 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the previous 24 hours, you didn't have an hour of idle time that water stopped going through your meter. And that is current month? That is for June. June, okay. So it's, okay, a, thank it's, you. it's a routine in the software that says, hey, if you didn't have a single hour with no water coming through, was the bill a lot bigger than you expected? We haven't gotten a bill yet. We just got the notification. Okay. 
Um, so we go out and read them. I guess most of them are read in the one day, and if we have any errors or things, we send people out to re-read -re that meter. Um, there are people that ask the question, you know, like the gas company, the electric company will sometimes um, send you an estimated bill based on past usage. We don't do that. Um, we, we, send, we read every meter every month, and so there are no estimated bills, and uh, I think that's an important point. Yeah, so therefore there's never any catch-up bills because right. oftentimes that's a question we will get is, oh, they must have estimated, and now this bill they're doing a catch-up. So. Okay, um, so after it goes through the meter, um, in the winter time, most of it comes into the house, unless somebody's filling a pool or doing what have you, uh, most of it goes into the house. And typically, when water comes into a house, it goes into showers and dishwashers and toilets, and um, about 75, 80% of it <laughs> comes back out into the sewer system. So we're gonna shift gears and talk about um, sewers. Most people don't really like to think about sewers, um, but they, um, they're really important to our way of life. Um, that's important. So this little schematic I just clipped off the internet and it kind of shows the three, uh, well, the two systems that are effectively storm systems. We have separate stormwater and sanitary sewer systems here. So stormwater is designed to take rainfall, get it off the streets, get it out to the creek. Um, that system is managed by the town, so we don't personally get involved in that, um, but we certainly interact with it. There are places, it's a gravity flow system, there are places where, you know, we may have conflicts with that and we have to go around it, um, but generally speaking, that's, a, that's something that the town is managing. Um, the, um, so let's take a look at this here, um, I lost my mouse again. So um, this was actually designed to show what some of the problems can happen, uh, are that can happen in your systems. Typically out near the road, you would have a clean out. Um, and that's where there's the demarcation zone between what's private plumbing and what's owned by uh, the mud. So we don't, you know, that's, if it's on your property and you have a lateral coming out of your house like um, this one, that's yours. And you have to take care of it if it gets roots in it. If it clogs up uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, then that's a private property matter. Um, typically, we try to help our customers, and we'll come out and try to TV um, this line for you if we can. Um, you know, one of the other things we have in our budget that I'll show you later is a new TV truck. Um, they're a little bit uh, expensive, but it's a helpful tool to help people know, hey, this is where the problem is, and it's clearly on your side of the fence. If it's not, then it's on our side and we can go fix it. Um, so the sewer would come out of the house, come into the sewer main. Um, sewers typically flow by gravity. So the old um, engineering axiom is that uh, water flows downhill by gravity and uphill to money. <laughs> That's just it. So you know, if you want to push it uphill, it's going to cost some money. Um, another piece of that, though, is that sewers typically do not flow pressurized. So it's not a pressure pipe like it is on the water side where we have to maintain 20 PSI on the water side, 20 pounds per square inch, or it's a violation of TCUQ rules. Um, and those elevated storage tanks help us maintain that pressure. Um, but it's a critical thing, and we have to report it and take bacteria tests if we believe that our pressure drops below 20 PSI on the pressurized side. Now, there is one place where that's not true. We do have some pressurized area of the sewer system, and those are um, near our lift stations. I'll talk about that in a minute, but there was a fairly recent example of that. So right by the new restaurant that's going in down here, um, just off of Trophy Wood Drive, uh, a contractor was digging in there, and he hit our force main. So we have a lift station. It's number three, I believe, that pumps water west along the north side of the 114 right away. It's a 10 inch main and it goes up to the top of the hill, dumps into a manhole, and then it flows by gravity to the wastewater plant. When that contractor hit the pipe, everything that was above it on the pressurized side had to flow back out through the hole. Um, some of that went in a storm drain and affected um, the town's challenges around managing their own stormwater permit. Um, but, you know, that was a, a case where, um, you know, the contractor did not even ask for a dig permit. He just started digging. 
Uh, but that pipe, under normal circumstances, is pressurized to get it up the hill. So those are called force mains, and we'll talk a little bit more about lift stations in a minute. Um, now, uh, when I first got here, I asked the question, well, so how many manholes are in Trophy Club? We didn't know. Um, we probably still don't know exactly. Um, but the team at the wastewater plant actually pulled out the map book and counted them. Anybody want to hazard a guess? <coughs> I've heard a couple of numbers. One's about 1,200 and the other one was over 2,000, so. 1,274 is the number I've got in my notes. Um, 1,274? Yeah, so they counted them by looking at the map book and looking at the dots. Now, whether we have a dot for every manhole, I don't know. Um, it's been my experience that sometimes our records are not good in all utilities in the country, and uh, certainly true here, but that's a lot of manholes. Um, so. Um, certainly other things can happen here. The laterals, um, we have fairly constant um, efforts by insurance companies to insure these laterals coming out of houses because um, it's pretty expensive. If you have to replace your lateral, it could be a couple thousand bucks. And they're constantly calling the mud saying, hey, we, you know, we have this great program. One of them's um, um, sponsored by one of the municipal leagues, I believe, saying you can just add this $5 a month on the bill and we'll insure their sewer lateral which means they'll send someone out to fix them. We've avoided that because we don't really want to be in the insurance business, nor do we want to, um, well, every time I've talked to an attorney about it, we don't want to be in that business, and we don't want to be perceived as favoring one insurance product over another, and we don't want to be perceived as selling it because if you're doing that and you're sending out promotional literature, um, that's just not a good place for a public entity like ourselves to be. Okay, so let's... Um, so what is a sanitary sewer overflow? This is against the law, but effectively, if water flows by gravity through a sewer, it's on a very, usually at a slow grade, uh, most of the time it's less than half full. Um, there's solids in there that come through toilets and um, you know, a variety of, you know, you grind up a bunch of carrots and stuff in your garbage disposal, there's solids in there that could get stuck in the lateral, and so they usually have a, a slope on them. It's not a big slope, but a downward slope. And the water in the pipe helps push down any solids and take them out to the wastewater plant. Now, if there's a clog, um, what happens? Well, the pipe fills up and it backs up and it typically comes out the upstream manhole. So um, when we get a call for an SSO, we have to report it to the state. Um, there's some different levels of reporting that you have to do depending on the size. We, we heard a recent report in Dallas where um, a directional drilling contractor had drilled through the side of a very large main and they spilled millions of gallons of sewage as a result of that. Um, that's a utility conflict and directional drillers are a little bit scary in that regard. Um, I've run into that problem before, but this is what they look like. Um, in um, both, well, in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, I worked with the utility there. They had a program that um, allowed people that lived in the town to call and report one of these and they gave them a 50 bucks. Yeah, it's like, you report one of these, we're going to do that. Um, some people see them, and they don't necessarily know what they are. Uh, wow, that doesn't look right, but they don't really go to the effort of calling. Now, in a situation like this, it's usually a big rainstorm, so that is very dilute sewage, right? So there's a ton of water coming through there. It might not, not even smell bad, um, or just might have a minor odor to it. So, like, you look at the one on the right, and it looks pretty clean, but it's blown that lid right off of the manhole cover. So, the bottom line is that um, when the sewer functions as designed, it's against the law. <laughs> and we have to, uh, I guess, take our penalty strokes, is what they call it. Okay. Oh, one more thing about that. Um, so, when you get a violation notice from the state um, TCEQ, what is the violation for an SSO? It's written against the discharge permit of the wastewater plant. So we're regulated on what can come out of the wastewater plant, but the violation says very clearly, you bypassed intentionally the sewer plant. It's like, well, no, it functioned as designed, but they don't want to hear that. The, the way that it's done is they write the violation against the discharge of the sewer plant, and we have at least one vocal person in town who, um, reminds us of that, that it's against the law and we shouldn't do that. But in my mind, it's, um, that's problematic because, in fact, it's the sewer doing what it was designed to do. We, we need to be responsive and try to avoid 
um, SSOs, I'm, I'm all for that, but technically it's a bypass of the water plant. Carmen, it, while, you're, while you're on sewer lines, before you go on, uh, inverted siphon. Mm -hmm. I noticed on, the, uh, on our weekly report that the inverted siphon's being cleaned. And I kind of went, I only knew of one inverted siphon. So uh, do we have more than one? And they are that maintenance intensive that they need to be cleaned weekly? Um, well, I'll let Mike speak to this. He's, he's more knowledgeable than me, but I asked him that question when you asked. Um, there are apparently two. And so for everybody's benefit, an inverted siphon, when you have to go under something, the sewer line comes in at an angle, it goes underneath it, it comes up on the other side. And so it's actually full and a little bit pressurized under a creek, under some obstacle. It comes up and it comes out on the other side. So it has the tendency to collect debris at the bottom if it's not moving very fast. It, technically, that's what the problem would be now. Um, I know we um, will get to it later, but we just have one or two folks that work on those sewer line cleaning pieces. And, um, and so I, I think it makes sense to clean them fairly often so you don't run into a well, problem. You obviously, don't want to, you obviously don't want it to block. How time, how labor intensive is, I mean, do we go out and spend 40 minutes doing it or is it like a three hour job? Um, I would say probably in between that, I would say probably about somewhere around an hour and a half. Because wow. usually when, they, when there's an inverted siphon, there's not just one pipe, you'll have two or three different ones. So it depends on the flow because you always want to keep flow going through there. You don't want it to stop, you know, lose suction okay. to do that. But we have one right here across from Tom Thumb. I don't know. Yeah, if I remember that one. Yeah, we used to have an aerial sewer crossing where we put in an inverted siphon and went under that creek. The other one was when the PID came online. It is right at the end of Trophy Club Drive where it dead ends and the golf course back there. And we actually have an alarm system on that one. Okay, so are there like three, we say an inverted siphon, that's singular, but mm -hmm. there are actually probably three lines in each one of these where it goes down and then manif manifolds out, manifolds back together then? Yes, okay. we're in the manholes. And I think the one over here across from Tom Thumb, I think it's got two, but it may have three. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I put this picture in. I got to spend a year in Chicago uh, working on water line replacements. And um, this is a picture of the intersection at Madison and Clark in downtown Chicago. Um, I lived on Madison, but out in the West Loop. And I, was, I spent a lot of time walking there because it cost 40 bucks to park a car downtown. Um, and I was amazed at how many manholes you'd see in an intersection. So I went through and counted, and if you look at this one, you got a couple, couple over here. I think there's one right over on there on the bigger picture. I counted 13, and then right out in the middle, the, there's this one that looks like a water valve cover. There's literally 13 manholes in this one intersection. So think about that. What's down there? People see them all the time, and then we generally don't say, well, geez, what would Stephen King think is down there? Um, but um, nonetheless, you know, do you all know what's down there? So I wanted to help with that. Now, Chicago is a special deal. They have pipe in the ground. They bury it five feet down because it gets so cold. And they have um, oil lines, like old, the old fuel oil lines. They have um, every electrical and fiber optic company in the country is, is there, and it's buried infrastructure. They've certainly got, um, in some cases in this area, in particular, combined sewers. So the stormwater and the sanitary or the sewer go together, and that creates a big problem for them. There's actually buried rail lines in these streets. So when you go to replace a water line, there are a lot of utility conflicts just to dig in and get to where you're going. Um, there's all kinds of other things that happen. but um, And then there's actually evidence of the fire from like 1890s or something like that that burned down half of Chicago. They still have some active water mains that were there when, uh, not many, but were there when Abraham Lincoln was giving stump speeches. So um, they're behind on their pipeline replacements. Okay, so here's a couple of pictures of manholes. What are they? Well, there's nothing super special about them. The one on the left is kind of a standard precast. You can go buy it. Um, and typically you'll have one line coming in and one line coming out. And if there's a clog, um, we go to the, I guess, upstream manhole, try to push something through it, or the downstream manhole. Um, and then cleaning-wise, you open the manhole, you run the jet rotter up it, and clean out the pipeline. Um, you can often have multiple pipes coming into a manhole. It can be an intersection. 
and they can come in at different levels at times, so um, they're designed like that. The one on the right is a brick manhole. Um, up until you know, the 50s, they were mostly built out of brick. They would just go stack them up and build them out of brick. Now, I think, if I remember correctly, we had a, at least one brick manhole in the system. It was the one right behind the plant, and they went in and um, sealed the inside, if that's right. There may be a lot of them. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I will say this. Manholes um, are places where air comes up and there's vents typically in the lids. Um, sewer gases, when they're agitated, can release um, hydrogen sulfide gas, which combined with water creates sulfuric acid. So in terms of deterioration of concrete or mortar between bricks or even just rusting of the manhole lid, these are areas that do not last as long as the lines themselves, I guess. So they're more susceptible to that. There's actually, um, when we talk about asset management, there's a program um, I want to say it's called NASCO, where they train people to give ratings on the conditions of these assets so they can be fairly consistent about it and the asset can be replaced before it fails. So what's in a lift station? So we've had, um, we had a challenge at lift station number one here back in March. Um, we talk about them a lot of times, but most people don't really know what's in there either. So effectively, uh, most of them are deep manholes where if you look at the little graphic on the right, the sewer flows by gravity into the chamber and the water level comes up. There's a submersible pump in there, um, which can, it has a grinder on it, so it grinds up any solids that would be hard to pump. And then it pushes it up a force main on the output side. So that's a lift station always has a pressurized side and a gravity side coming into it. Now these lift stations are critical to avoiding violating the law um, for TCEQ. Um, in the case of this one, we had some blown fuses and it led to um, uh, basically the electrical panels were old and um, we had some other challenges there too. The wire from the electrical company was underground. This pole right here um, was bent about 10, 15 degrees on angle and the, and the cable was connected to it. So the theory was that it went like this every time the wind blew and the ground would get saturated so it had room to move. And eventually the insulation on that blew. Um, Mr. Chapman, I know that you um, asked a question about it. It was a good question, and I still haven't heard back from the folks that looked at that. But I, um, I think it was um, just it was a wear thing that it just kind of came off like that. Now the shear um, might have happened in part when they were digging it up to take a look at it. But um, nonetheless, that's been repaired. Um, we approved um, the final part of the financing on that just recently. Uh, we have 10 of these lift stations. Um, each one of them has two pumps in it, so we have, you know, one that runs primarily, but there's a backup pump. And they range in size, I want to say the, the diagram I saw was from three um, horsepower pumps up to 40 horsepower pumps. So the size of electricity coming into the lift station is kind of dictated by the size of that pump. Um, you know, truly, um, we've kind of neglected some of these lift stations. They, um, they, we're going to see some rebuilds on those pumps over the years. And I think we need to develop a good strategy for having the right spares on the shelf. Um, we had one that went for months with just one while we were trying to decide, do we rebuild it or replace it? And that doesn't make sense to me. You really ought to have some spares on the shelf that can handle those things. This one's up and running good now, um, so I'm happy about that. Again, look at that fence. It's got its own challenges, <laughs> and um, it's a nice little area. I don't know if the town doesn't manage this area or not because um, it doesn't look to be a part of anybody's yard, so it's somebody who's got the area around the lift station, and it gets mowed periodically, so I'm assuming it's um, the town has a right-of-way there or something along those lines. Well, um, all roads lead to the wastewater plant on the sewer system for sure. And um, I pulled this um, aerial that um, I thought would be useful for a couple of purposes. So, um, let's see, Mr. Chapman, you're the only one I've not had out to the plant. So let me just say that the, the water flowing by gravity into the plant is right here, it comes into this chamber. There are bar screens there, so they take out anything, say, above an eighth of an inch um, in cross-section. Um, I had my first job in a pretreatment and pump station in Salt Lake City. 
And we called those bar screens the salad bar, which is kind of a gross internal reference. But it was, you know, it is, you, that's what comes out there. There can be um, all kinds of things that show up, and a lot of times it's food waste and um, those types of things. So we take out the big stuff right there. Right after it, there's another set of pumps, and they pump up into this new structure that's just been constructed here. From there, we have a finer screen that takes it down to, I want to say it's a sixteenth of an inch screen, so it's a rotary screening device. It takes out more solids, so it's a continual process of solids removal through the plant. From there, it flows into this new splitting structure, which allows the water to go to one of the five basins in this membrane bioreactor plant. Now, I like to just use the terminology that what we run here is a bug farm. It's, um, it's a, you know, basically when there's food um, and it's left outside, you know, whether it's, um, you know, you pour a Coke down the drain, it's got some sugar in it, um, bacteria will eat that and they will turn it into body mass and we can settle that body mass out. Now, in the old days, we had a conventional plant. It's gone now, but there were two circular clarifiers right here. So you you basically try to convert all the dissolved material in the waste stream into um, bacteria, basically, and then let them settle out. And we would call that sludge, or um, the more um, politically correct term is biosolids. Um, but, you know, that's what it is. It's um, a good fertilizer amendment. Um, a lot of people use it. We, we send ours directly to the landfill. Um, probably don't produ produce enough of it to make it economical to try to reutilize it. Um, but that's basically what happens. So from this splitter structure, it comes into our new basins. Um, this is showing, okay, so we start on this end. It's basin one, two, five, and six. Three is, I think, in startup phase right now. And um, they're all running really well. We're getting some great results out of the plant itself. And we have some other challenges there, but the process is working really well. Um, so instead of settling, we're separating the solids in a different way. That's the way to think about it. We have a membrane and we're filtering them out. We're not letting them go by gravity. Um, and that's a difference. Um, you know, certainly um, we're not seeing virtually any bacteria coming out of this plant. Um, after that water comes through, it comes over to this device where there's a UV contactor. And it's also the effluent diversion structures on the back end of it. So we have four pumps here. At least two of them go over to the uh, ponds at the golf course. So we're providing potable reuse water, or not potable, but uh, reuse water, non-potable reuse water or beneficial reuse to the golf course. And they use it for irrigation. Um, I know that they're getting better water now than they ever have. I mean, it's, it really looks good coming out of there. Um, but we've had some challenges getting those pumps replaced because the state says that it has to go through, it's in our discharge permit, it has to go through the UV disinfection process. Um, I tried to get them to change their mind and give us a waiver on that for a week. They didn't do it. So the construction team figured out a way to um, get it done. And I understand that at least two big ones have been installed. And tomorrow morning is the startup. So once that's done, we should be able to give the, the golf course everything that we get. Now, we're not always getting a lot. I think our average last week was 0.9 million gallons or something like that. It was it's not a huge uh, day, sorry, a million gallons a day. So maybe five, six million gallons. And I don't imagine that puts a lot of water in a pond the size of the one by the clubhouse. Um, we, we, can't, we can't manufacture water there. So um, Mike, you and I looked at these pumps. So we get the two older pumps now, right, that are being replaced by those two big new pumps. Yeah, would the, would, would the smaller ones still be operational? The small ones will be replaced with newer pumps after the two larger ones are online. From a capacity standpoint, just roughly, how much more water can, will the two bigger pumps then be able to pump versus the two smaller? Is it twice as much? You know, thirty percent more? Just I'm just trying to. Yeah, I would say they're probably going to end up getting about three hundred thousand gallons more a day. So I, I looked at the week in question because we had some questions come in from our um, friends at the golf course. And 66% um, of the water that came out of the wastewater plant went to the golf course. Um, so we only lost about 34% of it. And if you look at the weir, I mean, the water flows over the weir and goes down to the creek here on the back side, or we pump it out to the golf course. So there's just this little creek that comes out here. Right. 
And in the wintertime, when there's no irrigation going on, on the golf course, all of the discharge goes out to that creek and on down to Lake Grapevine. Um, you know, the two smaller pumps allow us, when you, they don't need a lot of water, to use smaller pumps to pump the water over to the golf course ponds. And, um, you know, I know they've got behind just because we've had this challenge going on over here. But it's actually been pretty dry um, as well. So, um, you know, there was maybe, I, I think I figured six and a half million, 6.8 million gallons that went through the plant in that week. And they got 66% of that, which means that, you know, four or five million gallons, something like that. So, so 66% went to the golf course. The other third went Just to went Lake Rebine. Right. Mm -hmm. If we had those bigger pumps, how would that change the 66, 36, you know, well, it, it would go to 100. We could pump 100% okay. of it. So, and by tomorrow, we should be able to do that. But when we say we take in 0.9 MGD, that's inflow, and you're taking solids out of that. So we can't give back 100%. It's pretty close. I mean, the, um, the total amount of solids that come out. Um, really? Is, yeah. Okay. I bet, I bet you're talking less than 3% of the total flow. Really? I would have thought it would have been something way higher than yeah. that. Getting smart. Thank you. So one last question, Mike. Are they both pumps going to be operational tomorrow? Is that the hope or just one? They should both be, but they are much larger pumps. I mean, we would definitely not need to run them both at the same time. One of those pumps should be able to pump all of the flow to the golf course. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I thought this was instru instructive for a couple of other reasons. So um, we now have a, effectively there's no settling separation. So when we have to take some solids out of the process, the, you know, the colonies, have, we call it mixed liquor suspended solids, MLSS, it's a great sound. Um, they just pump a little bit of that water up in here to the sludge beds. They aerate it some more, or to the sludge basins. Um, and then it comes over into this building where we have a press and we squeeze the water out of it because um, you know, if you don't squeeze the water out of it, and you send it to the landfill, you're just shipping a bunch of water, and that's expensive. Um, you know, we've had some challenges with the operation of that belt press, but I think it's doing better now. And, um, you know, this area is just kind of a covered area where we can set stuff out to dry. Uh, right now it's being used for parking. And before that, we had all the membrane racks that were in construction underneath this, this um, overhead roof. Um, there's an area right in here which is... Um, uh, as I understand it, mud property, right now it's a basically a boneyard for all the stuff that's been demolished in the old water plant process. But um, I, I clipped the picture in this way because you could see a couple of things. This is the maintenance barn that we've talked about. So the gate to the wastewater plant is right here. And this structure is the what we call the maintenance barn. And it's um, uh, occupied by Parks and Rec. I believe entirely. They, they do maintenance work out of there. You can see some of their soils and other mulches um, stacked over here. Um, and the town pays us a lease on this, so I don't really want to get into that kind of stuff. But um, we were talking about it the other day, and I, I didn't know if people understood that. I estimated from Google Earth that there's about 0.8 acres of land under this building. It's for what it's worth. And um, so um, you can also see this side of um, some sand traps off of a hole over here on the golf course. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what hole that is. Maybe one of you gentlemen know. <laughs> um, so. Um, and we do own the property to the right. Yeah, right there, I, I don't actually know where those lots are. The ones I know they're over in the tree line, but I, I honestly don't know. Head north. It's north, so it's over here. Yeah, it's it's north of the north of the plant structure. It goes up to the core property. Yeah, I've never seen the plats for that, but um, thank you. Okay, so that's kind of it on um, just kind of a general overview of the system, how water comes in, how water goes out. Just to give you a time check, it's 7.05. Thank you, sir. Um, in terms of services that we offer, um, you know, effectively we, um, we help fund fire service. I didn't put that on here because that's um, something that the fire chief will come and talk to you all about on Monday the 16th, so I kind of neglected that here. It's your fourth bullet. Did I have it? Oh, I guess I put it in, sorry. Um, potable water service we provide to our customers. 
um, either directly to mud customers or indirectly to our PID customers. Uh, wastewater collection and treatment, uh, beneficial reuse water to the golf course, uh, fire service, and then customer care and utility billing. So, um, you know, we do um, provide billing for some other services that the town provides. I want to say solid waste is on there, and I believe there's a stormwater fee. Um, that come, I've never seen a trophy club bill itself, so... Um, but um, those are the basic services that we offer. Uh, water, wastewater, and beneficial reuse are all regulated by the EPA, and um, they do that through TCEQ. So um, back in the 70s, uh, President Nixon signed the legislation that created the EPA. Before that, it was like the National Health Service or something like that. Um, shortly thereafter, they wrote the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, so two different sides of the house. Um, Clean Water Act was designed to regulate um, wastes that were discharged to the waters of the United States. And the drinking water rules were designed to, you know, protect public health on, on the drinking water side. Um, they've gone through several revisions and additions over the years since then. Uh, but effectively, it's federal legislation, and a state like Texas can become a, prim a primacy state, meaning they can enforce those rules on behalf of EPA by you know, putting in place an administration program, um, a, um, including a punitive program to fine people for not doing it right, um, as long as it matches um, EPA's expectation. Uh, there are sometimes conflicts between the states and EPA in Washington in terms of, you know, is this program good enough to match up with what you thought the law said? Um, that's pretty common. Um, the fire service is governed by an agreement with the Town of Trophy Club, and that's in your packet and on your memory sticks. Um, I just read it the first time um, here in the last month, so I'm learning. But um, um, I think that's a pretty good agreement. And like I said, uh, Wade will be here um, to talk to our board. I think he's first on the agenda next Monday, the draft agenda, um, to talk about his vision for the operation of the fire department and then um, at least a short overview of the budget that he's proposing. Um, I wanted to get that in place because there's budgetary impacts to um, um, his vision for the upgrade of the service. And um, you know, I felt like it was important for our board to get to see that um, before we end up on the 24th. Quick question, kind of a little bit off topic, but you kind of brought it up a little bit. Did we get agreement with the town to do our portion first and then, um, and then have them go into. I, I had heard. Six I, I had seven. heard that we have, but I have not talked to Tom yet, so um, I can't tell you for sure. Um, Lori, do you, did you hear anything from Holly in terms of a new draft agenda? We saw we have saw one a long time ago. I saw one today. Is it? So we're first. Okay. So. Excellent. Sweet. Okay. Operations. Um, so uh, I just wanted to put this in. Um, you know, we're effectively operating a water and sewer system on an eight to five schedule. So um, typically we're not staffed after hours or on weekends. We always have a water operator on call um, at night and on weekends and a wastewater operator on call. Um, but we are dependent on um, our IT systems to get those alarms. And we've had some challenges with that recently. Um, I'm excited to say that we're um, talking with the town right now about piggybacking on a point-to-point -point wireless project that they were doing um, that actually is we could co-locate some additional, um, say, resilient communication features. Um, and we may end up bringing back to you a request to um, divert money that we had in the capital budget for one item uh, to participate in that project here towards the end of the year. So I'm excited about that. Um, but, you know, it's an important thing because if we have an overflow of one of the tanks, last Friday night there was a lightning strike on the eastern tank. It took out the antenna. Um, we um, you know, broke it in three pieces, and you know, we've got a good contractor that we work with on Mike's SCADA system over here in the water yard. They, um, they did the repairs also for lift station number two. Um, they came out. They happened to have a spare antenna on site. But... Now, I'm short of that, we would have had to have an operator kind of monitoring the level and say, turn the pumps on. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, that's 
what you try to do, we haven't increased staff for a long time. We'll talk about staff here in a minute. But, um, you know, if you're going to try to operate uh, unmanned during nights and weekends, you're really going to try to do that with tools like IT tools. And um, we're not as robust as I would like to be on the IT side. That tank's been hit before, hasn't it? Not that long ago. Okay, thanks. Um, our operators for water and wastewater um, have to be certified at the appropriate level by TCEQ. There's a process for that. And um, um, I think as I look at it, the district has a long history of cross-training amongst their operators. So when we have a problem, it's an on, you know, all hands on deck sort of an issue. Our water operators can cross over and work on the wastewater side and vice versa. Um, that's really a good thing. And I um, want to continue that practice. <coughs> all right, so let me switch gears for a second. Talk about the organization um, and personnel. Um, okay, so this is my attempt at an org chart. And again, I apologize for my lack of skill in um, graphic design. I um, couldn't quite figure out how to get those boxes to look evenly spaced. So um, that's just going to have to live. I did not um, put the board in here, um, but I, I know who directs the general manager. So um, we have um, Mike right now performing an acting operations manager role. So um, that is a job that we had priced in our salary survey. Um, it's my intent to um, uh, move Mike into that role on a permanent basis where he would met yes sir okay so I, let, I need to clarify is this where we're at now or this is where we're headed or intent to head we're, we're, this is kind of where we're at now and we're going to talk a little bit about the history here because it, it comes up in several okay. contexts so it's my understanding that at one time we actually had what was effectively an operations manager and just a wastewater plant manager but the operations manager managed the wastewater plant manager and all of the field operations when our last uh, wastewater superintendent came, is what I understood is when it happened, but I could be wrong on the timing, the lift station work and the sewer cleaning work got moved over under that other superintendent. Now, in my mind, this, uh, we have a complicated new state-of-the-art plant, um, and um, you know, tying someone up with what's effectively a distributed maintenance function, um, it has geospatial aspects to it, um, it, didn't make, it doesn't make sense to me, actually. Those things tend, tend to be in what we call field operations. They're field operations. They do what they do. And even today, um, if there's a lift station overflow, the alarm comes through the water plant. It doesn't go through the SCADA system at the wastewater plant. So, I mean, that, that still persists to this day. Um, so uh, I'll just try to step through that. So um, one of the things we did when we went out for the survey was we wrote a job description for that and had them price it on a salary basis. Of course, the district secretary, you know, um, right before um, she left us, uh, Michelle um, was relocated to be a direct report of mine. Um, and that position is vacant now, and I want to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. And of course, Stephen is our finance manager. Um, previously, we had, um, as I understand it, um, what they call a administration manager. And when Stephen came to the district, he took on a role that was um, basically staff accountant and HR manager. Right. So um, that's, that's a combination of roles, but he, he had done that for some time. And since um, um, Renee left, he's been handling both functions, actually. Uh, his own, um, the HR piece, and um, so on. We'll get to that here in a minute. Um, so let me go um, down to the next level then. So. Um, our wastewater plant superintendent position is vacant. Um, I want to let that out, just isolate the role to the wastewater plant. We need somebody to really focus on that, get the maintenance management stuff set up there, make sure that we're on our game and we're not uh, failing any warranties that we might get out there. I'm really concerned about that. Um, it's on the street, and I'm not totally sure when, um, uh, when it closes, but I'm hopeful that we'll get some good candidates for that. Um, at the wastewater plant, we have a, a person who is a shift supervisor, which is um, kind of a strange title. And it was my understanding, talking to our previous wastewater superintendent, that there was at one time a thought that um, the plant would go to 24-7 operations. 
And so this position was created, the title was created, but it's effectively a crew leader pay classification. Who, who is that? What's the name? Mike? His name is Frank. That would be Frank. Frank, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and in addition to him, we have three other people who are in utility field worker classifications. Um, we have a water crew leader, and he has four utility field workers that report to him. Uh, one of those is still in the wastewater budget, so you know sometimes we have to pull from one side of the house or the other. And um, we went with we had a couple of folks leave us um, on the water side, and so one of the guys that worked in our collections crew um, came over and has been uh, effectively assigned on the water side. Um, and then we have a collections crew leader who doesn't have a crew, <laughs> if that makes sense. That's why it shows like that. But, um, you know, if, if Dwayne needs help, and he, I don't imagine he can clean an inverted siphon by his, himself, you know, we have people crossing over from this other group of utility field workers to help. So that, you know, group really represents our frontline operations group on that side. Um, we just hired a new staff accountant. She's a nice young lady, and you all get to meet her someday. Um, and then we have three ladies that work on utility billing and um, customer care. Um, so that's kind of the current makeup of the system. We have two vacant positions, the communication specialist and the wastewater plant superintendent. The, uh, if I could, the manpower for the collections crew comes from where? Right now, there's, this is an individual. He's a long-term individual with the district. I want to say, last I heard, he was like 26, 27-year gentleman. And the one person who was kind of permanently assigned to that, um, his budget is still on the wastewater side of the house, is working over here. So, okay. um, But, you know, we pull him back out if we need him now. Um, Dwayne is our collection crew leader. He goes to every lift station every day and takes readings and you know, looks at the condition of things and... Um, so those types of activities don't necessarily require a two-person crew, but if we're doing some cleaning, um, we have to pull someone back from the other side of the house. Well, obviously, uh, the inverted siphons, for an example. Yeah, I mean, if we're getting the back truck out and we need something to do, I mean, somebody will be pulled. I mean, a back truck isn't a one-person one, one person job, no. I would not think. No, no it's that would be unsafe. A okay. one-person job. Okay. Um, Staff utilized the general manager's discretionary budget to fund a, effectively a compensation study. The classification part wasn't really part of it, but the, um, um, they went through and did surveys of other uh, organizations to compare our salaries um, to those in similar organizations. Now, um, at the outset, we had two or three positions that had never had a salary range established for them. Um, and we wanted to look at what would it cost if we reorganized a little bit, if we put in a couple of different <laughs> kinds of um, jobs that could help us out in a different way. As we've you know, taken on, as my understanding, we haven't really added staff even through the whole development of the PID, um, which is a big increase in responsibility, but we really haven't changed the head count. Um, we've tried to do it with technology and getting more efficient. Um, so Stephen and I worked on this. Um, he's still playing a role on the HR side, but it's one of the challenges we have, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, so uh, with thoughts that we might change the structure, uh, we had them price some job descriptions which did not exist at the time, and that included uh, the assistant superintendent, the human resource generalist, and the operations manager. Now, it's probably fair to say that the staff accountant position probably also didn't exist. I mean, we rewrote the job description. And, you know, Stevens did Stephen's old role, um, finance and HR. So he's handling finance stuff, and there's a fair amount of HR that is finance. So you got payroll, got benefits, you know, estimation of when we get into the budget time. There's, there's, those things are HR. Um, you know, but we don't really have someone working on the other parts of HR, like hiring, um, you know, those kind of things, and um, disciplinary actions, um, you know, writing policy, looking out for those kind of elements. So um, we did that. Um, whoops, I don't want to go beyond that. So um, you should have um, the results of the survey along with a staff memo somewhere in your stuff. Um, so I, I, I put those together with a cover memo. And I, I really don't want to spend too much time on it right now, except to say that I put a cover memo in, 
and look through those results. And at a future board meeting, uh, we're going to bring back a staff recommendation for um, what we'd like to see. So I took it my swing at how I would organize that in a classification structure, try to keep it simple. I mean, that was my objective there. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, it's important because if we go back to, um, you know, this, in my mind, it's pretty clear that we want to create that uh, operations manager job. Mike's already been performing that role since March. Um, and just make that permanent. We got that uh, role priced in the market. I'm not so sure what to do with the communication specialist. So I will say this, um, there's a couple of outcomes that could happen. We priced an HR specialist. So we could hire, instead of a communication specialist, an HR specialist. If you only have 20 staff members in a MUD, do you want to spend 5% of your staff time on communications? When I look at the history of the communication specialist, and it's one of the challenges that I mentioned in that memo, um, you know, the that project was originally conceived. We had a staff person who was good at writing stuff up. They edited the website. They did a lot of event organizing, those kind of things. We went out to do the survey. We got PIOs back. You know, this is comparable to a PIO, and it's a $100,000 a year job. And so, um, you know, that's one of the questions is, you know, you could do that communication, but is it really worth the investment? Um, we just went through and uh, put out the consumer confidence reports. We're required by contract to do that. Uh, it's a pretty big effort, and it's likely that very few people will actually read it, um, even if we make an effort. That, that's true nationwide. It's just a fact. Uh, most people take stuff out of their bill that's not the bill itself and throw it in the garbage. That's what they do. And so, um, you know, it, it's um, I guess that's the, the punishment piece, right? If we do our job really well, nobody notices. When you said you'll bring uh, your plan back at a future board meeting, I'm assuming that's prior to the budget. Correct? Yes, sir. Um, I'm, I was thinking I could try to get it in by the 16th, but um, I don't think that's going to make it. But August will be good enough. And the establishment of the ranges, you know, will create a situation where we can look at where people are um, and try to do uh, compensation management in the kind of the modern way. And the way that I think of it in government circles is, if you've been in your role for three to five years, you're fully confident you should be about the midpoint. That's the market value of that role. Um, you know, I don't know where our people are relative to these um, class classifications and ranges, but I do think, based on my read of the personnel policy manual, you all have to approve that. So I'm going to make a recommendation, but you all have to say, well, you know, that's a terrible recommendation. Do it this way or whatever you want to do with it. But um, we'll get that established. To what extent it has a budgetary implication, um, I don't know that I can really say. For example, one thing you might need to do, and I'm, I was asked to put something on here about big issues over the next 18 to 24 months. Um, one of them is I think you need to hire a new general manager. And um, so we could, for example, I know, so I started to say this and I missed it. We had an administration manager, that job was downgraded, and Stephen was hired as the um, finance guy and HR person, we could contemplate upping that job back to an assistant <coughs> general manager job for a little while, get someone in and get them started, and um, let me ease out. That, that could happen. So there's some options with what to do with that position. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying what's the best way to go, but I'm, I'm not sure I want to <coughs> fill that position as it's currently constituted. Okay. We will be back with it. Okay, yes, sir. Just a quick question. I haven't seen it in anything here. Uh, is all of our IT outsourced? Pretty much. Um, you know, Stephen's managing the IT contract, so M3. Um, there is a detail, by the way, in the back of your budget packet that shows all the software stuff. Um, and it, I think it includes hardware on the IT side on that one detail. Um, on 29. On the budget on the SCADA side of the house, Mr. Chapman, the, um, you know, we're more careful about that. We don't let just anybody come in and work on our SCADA systems. Um, we do have some responsibility for security. Um, and so we do hire other contractors to work on that. So Mike has been working with, um, I forget the name of the company. DHS, DHS Automation. Um, they have a specialty in SCADA and automation type stuff. And we have firewalls between those networks and our own networks uh, for 
you know, day-to-day stuff. But M3 handles pretty much all of our IT work. And uh, Mike met with them today to talk with the folks at the town about that internal network um, and to see if we couldn't leverage that investment the town's making uh, to benefit ourselves. Okay, where did I go? I'll switch and talk about finances. I have a little bit of time to get. Okay, um, Stephen's here with us, and I may miss some of this, but I was just asked to give a top line overview of district finances. Um, um, you, at, at one point, you said you were going to go back and talk about HR, communication. Did you cover everything you want to do on personnel matters? I did um, at this okay. point, at this point, because I think okay. we need to come back and talk about what are some of the alternatives. Um, That's fine. I just want um, to make sure you cover everything. You but but I do think it's important for you all to think about that, you know, because I, um, I know one of our past board members said, you got to publish this thing that um, the, the water director's board had at their presentation. And, um, well, we could do that, but would people read it? I mean, you're going to make an investment of somebody's time to go put that up. Um, if nobody's reading it, um, is that really a good investment of uh, ratepayer money? I, for me, that's the question. So um, getting that right is a policy approach for you all, and I'd like you to think about it. We can, we can certainly have more debate about that going forward. You're at 730. Thank you. Um, okay, so if we look at um, uh, the, the very front page of your budget, I just put this pie chart together to show it. Um, 64 percent of our revenue comes from water sales 27 percent of our revenue comes from sewer sales or sewer services um, we have um, let's see one percent comes from O&M tax collection so the the taxes that go to water and sewer are very small wow. uh, I think it was hundred and twenty thousand is what I remembered on the front of the sheet um, there's some PID surcharges that then um, came through the contract with the with the town um, and then we have um, reserve funds which um, are effectively um, Stephen corrected me today those are carryovers from last year so for example our security project that we just com completed phase one of um, was budgeted in last year we just got it started and then it carried over to the next year so it shows as a revenue into this year's budget um, and then finally, everything else is about 5%. So, um, you know, it's, um, it's pretty clear where water falls, uh, water sales fall in terms of the overall revenue sources. Does water sales include the sales of the water back to the golf course off of the plant? I believe so, yes. Okay. You asked a question about that in particular, and I think the contract covers how many the rate increases for that over a certain number of years. So I think you asked me about how we rate set on golf yeah, course. Yeah, that contract that yeah. you had uh, sent to me, it does show that it's a, a graduated, I think it started at 75 cents per 1,000. I think we're now at 80 or 85 per, you know, 85 cents. I mean, year by year it graduates, at least from what I read. Okay. It caps off at, I think, 2020, or you know, it can be right. renegotiated or relooked at. Sure. It's, um, you know, I think it's a good use for wastewater plant effluent. I, I like the idea of doing it, and I, I know that it's a lot better quality now than it was three years ago. On the expense side, um, water is also a pretty high percentage of the overall pot. And again, um, we've got a $10 million budget in front of you. Um, nearly $3 million of that is going to Fort Worth to purchase water. <coughs> it's a big number. Um, on the wastewater side, we're up to... 30% of the total budget. Board of Directors has slipped down to effectively zero on the expense side. Um, administration, which includes a variety of things, is 12%. And then non-departmental um, is characterized on the budget, um, even on the front sheet there as, I think it's on the, oh, sorry, it's not the front sheet. It's typically things like attorneys, um, other sort of things that just can't be assigned to the general fund or a particular department. And I'd like to point out that I, it's not on this chart, but within that water and wastewater cost, I'm sure there's electricity. Yes, sir. And electricity is a big number for, for the operation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then I was trying to put together a pie chart that showed that part of it, right, where we back out the staff. So staff costs with benefits, 1.4 million a year. Um, 2.8 million goes to Fort Worth. 
Um, electricity was, I think, over, a, you know, it wasn't quite a million dollars um, in the budget. Bunch. It's a bunch, though. Um, yeah. So I didn't get to it. I'm sorry. I, I wrote those, signed those checks. Yeah, they're big. Um, so there's two tabs um, in your packets called GFB1 and GFB2 that show our debt service for one of them is for tax-based tax bonds. And the second one is, I think, for revenue debt service. I could have them backwards. Um, but it shows them, the front page shows the tax income um, to the various um, service funds. Um, so you take a look at those, and you'll see that they're all 20-year debt issues. Um, sometime in the next, you know, 12 months, I anticipate we'll be going out for a TCEQ bond um, to pay in part for the cost overruns at the wastewater plant and the 16-inch interconnecting pipeline. I'm going to recommend that that be a revenue bond issued for 30 years, not 20. Um, both of those assets can reasonably last 30 years, and it looks like we've never issued 30-year debt before. So, you know, effectively doing that um, allows the people benefiting from that depreciation to pay for it over a longer period of time. Um, on reserves and reserve policy, I, you know, um, Stephen tells me the best place to really look at that is in his uh, monthly report on the cash side. So if you look in the details of the reports he puts in your board packets, it will show how much money we have, and there's one that says spendable or you know, if I forget the exact terminology, Stephen, if you want to jump in there, it's. You have, you have assigned and non-assigned. You have spendable and non-spendable. Uh, just because our cash report shows, for instance, $8.3 million doesn't mean we have $8.3 million to spend. Uh, more than likely about 67% of that, about two thirds of that is going to be actually restricted, whether it be for bond repayment, uh, reserves for the bond. Uh, when we have, when we go out for bonds, we, we are required to keep uh, five years of basically bond payments that we put in reserves. So that way, if something happened during the day, we're obligated to pay our bonds, obviously. Uh, so every time we go out for a bond, that reserve goes up each time we do it, and we put that money aside so we can, we're obligated to pay our bonds. Uh, it kind of gives us, gives the bond companies a little bit of backing and, and trusting that, you know, we can make payments in case something happened on a rainy day, a rainy summer. Uh, we do have a, we do have a few gas fees out there. Uh, that we have to do by law. Uh, we have infrastructures out there. We have a savings account that we do put 200,000 from water and 200,000 from wastewater. That goes in for infrastructure that we want to replace. I think we've dissed into it a few times here and there, but nothing great. Uh, that money does sit aside through Prosperity as a savings account. That's our true reserves that we have set aside just for something that we need to use it for. Yeah, and I would say at some point, I'd like to get to a point to where our reserve actually show a true reserve i.e. the money that's not set aside for a bond, that portion of it, but reserves to all those gas fee accounts. And the 400K that we move over mm -hmm. have a section where it's clear what we have in reserves because when you look at that report, it's really, really fuzzy. There's no real easy way to tell truly how much you have in reserve versus how much we have in our operating account that we just have to cover because our revenue goes right. like this. <laughs> And I'll be ha more than happy to change reserve or change cash report uh, once we get, and I've talked to Carmen, I've talked to a few different directions, once we get a reserve policy set a point, me being the finance person, it'd be a lot easier for me to say, okay, you want to do X amount of days of operating? This is how we're going to get there. This is how long it's going to take. This is how much money we have set aside for this fund just for that operation. You being here prior to that, you kind of seen that we've gone kind of back and forth on how we want to do the reserve policy. Uh, so what we have what i present every month that 100 and something page packet i present every single month for financials is result of other directors over time that's what they wanted to see so i'm more than happy to change anything you would like to see just as a brief update for the board uh the old board uh i was talking about reserve policy where we were and i was directed to work with uh, carmen to develop a reserve policy uh, we've been bouncing some uh, fairly thick policy information from other other areas and research we've done backward and forth. I'm working on a draft now of melding about three, anyway, three different facilities together. And I'm gonna have to work, get back with you because obviously right. you two fellows are gonna need to take the red pen and go through it. Right. 
So in fairness, the, you know, the truth is I, 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 I'm interested in simplicity. And I think you mentioned either to Stephen or to me, I forget, I might have heard it secondhand, but, or maybe from Lori actually, but we have like all these different policies. Many of them are in the packet you just got. And, you know, like the investment policy effectively touches reserve policy. I mean, it's, um, you know, so we, we talk about these things in multiple different areas. And it'd be nice to, if we're going to do it, to clean it up and just get everything into one document that the staff can execute on. Because it's really hard sometimes to find, you know, what's the, what's the sweet spot where we can actually do what we're expected to do. Um, it, it's a challenge. So um, we did collect a bunch of other people's examples. Um, but what I saw from both Tempe and I sent the presentation out, Tempe, Arizona, and Fort Worth, they boiled it down to two things. We want days of cash on hand. That is a parameter that bond rating agencies look at. And it's days cash on hand for your O&M expenses. Your debt service is a different matter because we, we have reserves for debt service. So it's days and it's for those types of activities. And then they um, picked net position as another one. Now that seems to be tied to Gatsby policy. Uh, governmental accounting standards board um, and um, as near as I can tell you can only calculate that number um, at the audit I mean it's you can calculate it then but it's not a useful it's not a useful North Star to people trying to operate the district it's been a lot of interesting reading I'll assure you um, let's see catch up to myself in my notes Hmm. One of the other things I was asked to do, and we're at 56. I wonder if we should go. 738. Well, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to jump ahead to um, just a real brief discussion of wastewater treatment plant condition. And, um, and then maybe we could take a break and just go have that quick phone call with Matt and come back and finish the rest. If that's okay with everyone. Okay, so let me tab forward here. Okay, so this is pay request number 30 for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we get one of these every month. And um, so I guess there's a handful of things I wanna say about it. Um, Originally, this contract price was $13,335,000 for the contractor to build the plant. There was another $1.5 million contract for the engineers to provide design and construction phase management services. It's a different, uh, it's a different payment, but here's the deal. So um, our engineer, CPNY, gets this request from the contractor every month. They go through and make a recommendation to the, the MUD on what we pay. So we get one of these. And so the, if you look at the underlying black letters, um, that's what Weber Cadagua has submitted to us. And then you see things get lined out um, because our engineer doesn't agree that they're suitable for payment at this time. That said, where we are is... Um, so I can't do it in my head. I probably should have calculated that before. Uh, 762 days was the original contract time. Um, there's been 1,117 days gone by when this thing was issued, May 25th. Um, so um, we'll go down to the um, bottom. Um, Weber Cadagua thinks that they're 97.6% complete. Uh, CPNY is saying, well, you're more like 96.6. But the bottom line is we're close. I guess for me, that's the, the key issue here. Um, the plant is running well. We, we are having a few challenges. They have a thick punch list of stuff to get through. We're withholding reserves to make sure that they get all of those punch list items complete. You know, one of the, one of the um, what's the word, the uh, um, milestone issues was to get the effluent pumps complete for um, the effluent pumping station to the golf course and that's nearly complete as well so they've got some concrete work to do which would be pretty critical and then they do have a deep punch list of stuff to complete um, we did have a recent schedule update but i didn't feel like it was worth reporting to you all i'm expecting that will be done actually in august um, they showed they'd be done in july but it's probably not going to happen um, so within that contract, and we're going to go talk to um, our attorney about that, what are the rules, um, they had made a claim against us some time ago 
Uh, we had an off-site retreat with um, directors Rose and Wilson, um, our attorney, the engineers and their attorney, and the contractors and their attorney over here at Solana. Uh, we talked about it. We kind of went through the, um, you know, how, why is this project so far behind? Um, you know, effectively, the, the bottom line for us is that the original engineering contract was a million and a half dollars. It's now been amended four times, and it's up around uh, $2,300,000. All of that is really related to them being so far over schedule. I mean, we have to have inspectors and engineering review for things that was not planned originally. So that's what we're going to want to talk about. Um, you know, the team members at Weber Cadagua have been changed out many times. And I will say that the ones that we're working with right now really seem sincere about trying to get it done. Um, they do have their challenges, though. There's no question about that. Um, so I just wanted to show you this, what it looks like. You guys can see this anytime. I mean, it's just these are records that we have. It's a little confusing to go through this list and say, well, we started with this. We had some change orders um, that were driven by us. Um, there's been some other change orders that, um, you know, were just for time, for example. So we had one that... Um, came through fairly recently, was just for time, and we've just recently amended our change order approval process. So I do want to maybe take a break and go talk about that with Matt. Um, I have to do it in my office because we don't have a conference call phone in here. Um, and then we'll come back and finish up the rest of this stuff and hopefully get you all out um, before midnight. <laughs> Carmen, um, just so I'm clear, line six, is that the what we've totally paid to date, 13-3? Right. So let's say, you know, one of the early things that happened was they brought membranes on site and let them sit out in the sun. So these were to be installed, but the contractor can get paid under the three inch thick contract. <laughs> I think it's only two inches, but um, they can get paid under that contract once they deliver the goods on site. Well, they left them in the sun and um, there was a concern that Kubota would not um, back the warranty on it because they were discolored and so on and so forth. So Kubota was brought in. They, um, the engineer backed it out. He said, well, we already paid you for this, but we're not going to pay you anything else until we get caught up. And so there's been, there's been some conflict around that. Um, but at this point, um, Kubota has issued letters stating that they will back this warranty. They are in and working, and um, we have, as long as they're going to back the warranty, I, I'm good with it. Um, it's ultimately not Weber Cadagua back in the warranty so but as materials are put on site there's this question right so um, for example um, they brought some other membranes and hardware out and stuck them in a storage shed over in grapevine and said that those were delivered well um, if they're just put in a general warehouse um, with other people's stuff and the people in the warehouse go bankrupt um, you can't really segregate that as yours right so there's there's litigation precedent that says we've got to be careful about how we pay these pay requests under the contract. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I'm just asking the simple question of what have we paid to date? Is it on one of those line items that we've written checks for for this project? Is it the 13284 line 6? Mm, that's kind no. of a project, though. Yeah. But because we have other stuff that's this is just them. We have CPNY. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, not, just this. Just this aside. Web of Kadok. Yeah, yeah. The, the budget was thirteen three thirty five, right? What have we paid out to date? That's, that's thirteen three thirty five plus three hundred and sixty four thousand in change okay. orders brings the current amount to thirteen six ninety nine. And the balance to finish plus the retainage, and we're holding back. See, this is a confusing document. It's a yeah, yeah, Carmen. What he's asking is on line six, does line six equal the total amount of all the checks that we've given to Weber Cadagua for think, whatever reason? I think he's pretty close. Okay, that, that's all I'm asking. Right. Okay, got it. We can, we can look it up. No, uh, no, but I think that's the case. So, um, you know, these are pay requests that come through monthly, and um, it's a challenge. So, but we are close to the end. The plan is shaping up, and um, I don't know. I haven't been out there for a week or so. They started on the the what would be the eastern road. No, they right. have not. <laughs> well, at least they're focused on the effluent pumping station. In fact, I just got an email today that they wanted to visit about that. 
So we have challenges there because we have to have fire access on the site. And so if they're going to pour concrete, we have, it has to sit there for seven days without being driven on. And so there are those kind of just operational challenges in a construction zone. Okay. Are you it's a good time to pause? Yes, sir. It's a good time to pause. Okay. We will go into recess. Um, we're going to go to a closed session. Well, we're going to go to a executive session. It's all here. So language. Uh, pursuant to Section 551-071 to the Texas Open Meeting Act, the board may consult with its attorney in executive session on a matter which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under disciplinary rules of professional conduct of the state law of Texas clearly conflicts with the Open Meetings Act on or to seek advice of counsel on legal matters involving pending or contemplated litigation or settlement offers. Um, it's a contractor breach performance and payment issues related to district's contract with Weber Cadagua Partners for construction of wastewater treatment plant and instructions. Uh, it is 748, and we will enter into executive session. So do we have to turn off the... It is now 8.33. We're returning back to regu regular session. No actions was taken as a result of our uh, executive session. Next item on the agenda, are we still on a... Uh, I'll let Carmen proceed wherever he chooses. Where we left off, yeah. so we did jump we out We jumped forward. And yeah, we jumped forward, so. So I wanna come back, we're discussing just overall financial overview. I was asked to um, just kind of give a five-year rate history of the district. Certainly many of our customers um, have the sensation that um, they're paying a lot more now than they did in the past. I really struggle with this. I, um, as you know, I've only been here for um, just almost a year. Um, and many of these changes took place five years ago. So um, I went and looked in the rate order um, directory, which is on our local network. And there are two rate orders a year for the last five years. So if you're trying to say what happened when a rate change occurred and put it into any form of a, a communication that, that would simplify it and make it work, um, well, I spent a lot of time and I didn't get anywhere with it. I'll say that. So the choice I made was to pick two um, sort of typical water users that we see in our system and put together what would have happened for their bills um, under different circumstances. So let me introduce you to these two hypothetical families. The Harkonnen family, um, they have a one inch meter. In January, their typical use, and it's been consistent for the last five years, is 12,000 gallons a month. Um, and in August, they typically use 37,000 gallons a month. So um, they're, they probably fall a little bit above average in terms of their water use. The Freeman, on the other hand, um, have a three-quarter inch meter. Um, they're very frugal about their water use. Uh, in January, they typically use about 5,000 gallons a month. And in August, uh, when they are irrigating a little bit, um, they are using 12,000 gallons a month. So let's take a look at what happened to the Harkonnens and the Freeman over the last few years. So I, uh, once I threw away all my other slides, I came back to this. This felt like the best way to say it. So. Um, if you look at um, a January water bill for the Harkonnens, um, their bill has almost doubled from 4601 up to 8365 over the last five years. Um, there's been some changes in the way we calculate the sewer bill um, uh, from years to years. So um, there used to be kind of a capped flat rate and it later went to a winter, winter quarter averaging approach. So their January sewer, which has been consistent over that period of time, went from 4271 up to 7608 over that five-year period. Um, the biggest jumps happening in the last um, year or so. Um, when we turn around and look at their August bills, um, back in 1314, they would have been paying 12846 for that 37,000 um, gallons of water a month, and. Um, that bill um, went up by $100 over the last five years just for water alone. 
And um, when we looked at their sewer usage, um, it was 4271 um, the first year of that five-year period and jumped up to 7608. Now we go and look at the folks who um, were frugal for the entire period. Um, they didn't change their behavior during this period of time, but certainly the policies and rates adopted by this board have intended to get people to change their behavior and buy less of our product. That's by intent. We've done it that way on purpose, and that's actually really common around the country. A common conservation approach is to put in place a tiered rate structure and um, let those who use more pay more. Uh, the Freeman, they're fairly frugal in their water use. They're, um, they're using 5,000 gallons a month in January, and um, their water bill has gone from 25 21 over the last five years clear up to almost $37, $36.95. Their sewer bill um, in January has gone from 25 21 up to $36.83. So, you know, between the two of them, it's about 20 bucks a month over that period of time during the low water use months. When we take a look at their August water use, um, it has gone up a little from 4601 to 6857. Um, I would have no doubt that a part of that is the continual increases that we charge for um, funding the increases from Fort Worth. Fort Worth has been pretty aggressive in their uh, passing along the costs on the wholesale water side. Um, what's really interesting, though, is that their um, sewer bill in August actually went down uh, from 42.71 in the first year um, to 36.83. So, um, you know, we always hear um, people talk about, um, well, you know, my bill goes up every year, and in some cases that's true. Often, you know, um, it's not a, it would be a huge percent, but it's not a big dollar amount. Um, the Harkonnens would have paid some pretty big dollar amounts. Um, there's no question about that. But in terms of the overall impact to the Freeman, it was actually a positive benefit in August. And um, so that's, I guess, my, uh, what I'd like to share with the board about, you know, here's a couple of hypothetical cases. I was going to do one for commercial, but you now I thought, you know, the bulk of our customers probably fit in one of these two sort of bins. And it's a good way to look at it. I think for those who are really careful about their water use, um, the switch to the winter and quarter averaging has actually been a benefit for them. And the people who um, you know um, use a lot more water are paying more of their fair share. Okay. <coughs> so let's um, take a look at um, FY19. I don't have my agenda in front of me, but FY19. Um, <coughs> a couple of things to look ahead at the next year's budget. So we know that um, you know, we pay so much for raw water supply. We have staff costs. Um, those you know, go up a little bit every year, but not a huge change. Uh, we do have um, capital cost impact. So the example I want to give is not on this sheet, but um, last year we were budgeting for amendment number four to the CPNY contract for um, <clears throat> for the extended contract management at the wastewater plant. And we budgeted in what I call pay-go capital, um, $335,000, and we pulled it out of pocket and paid for it. Well, we at least budgeted for it. We're um, drawing that money down now as the original bond money for that project has been consumed. And we do anticipate that there's going to be a, a cost overrun on that project of about one to 1.6 million dollars which we think we have a good way to pay for but and um, we did that and when you think about it the sewer budget last year was about 2.4 million dollars so three hundred thousand dollars added in on the sewer side of the house on a 2.4 million budget is a huge cost driver in the rate increase that we applied on the sewer side last year uh, we're hopeful that we can um, find a way to amortize that after the fact so we're we pull it out of Pago Capital now, um, but we hope to amortize that, and that will provide some rate stability uh, in the next few years. But uh, the bottom line is what you pay in capital has a big impact on, on our budget for year to year. Um, one of the biggest ones is uh, water system improvements. You're, you're going to get an update on that project on the 16th for the interconnecting pipeline. 
Uh, we anticipate that that $5 million would be a bond issue, and, um, and so we'll have debt service payments that come out of that. Um, I think we're, um, if I remember correctly, Stephen, we're planning on budgeting for one payment in the next fiscal year, but I, um, right. is that right? We're planning on budgeting for the September uh, interest and principal for the bond. Just, that's, you know, we, 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 we want to keep it to the same as all the other bonds are, which we pay interest and principal in September. We pay interest only in March. So depending on what time we get this bond, uh, at least need a budget for a September payment. So I should have said that this um, spreadsheet I'm showing is I tried to blow up as big as I could so you can see the, the numbers, but it's um, a five-year draft, five-year CIP. We're working on improving this. Um, but um, so there are some other improvements that we want to make or purchases that we want to make that would come out of PAYGO capital and end up you know, being a part of any rate increases that come. So in terms of looking ahead at the FY1918 budget, these are the things that would be drivers. Um, on the wastewater system, we're, and I threw a number in here, we, we have not priced this out yet, but we do know that um, we're gonna need to buy some spare parts um, for our new plant just to have on the shelf, um, because some things take months of lead time to get them in, and so you wanna have a spare. Um, we haven't really provided for that yet, so I threw a number in there, 50 grand, could be more than that. Do we have any spare filters? Filters, not the air filter, but the waste in the membranes. Membranes. No, I don't believe so. Um, they're warranted for ten years, but it's kind of, as I understand it, more like a roofing warranty, where like the remaining they, they would pay for the remaining useful life of it. That would be the credit. So if you you know go five years, they might only pay half of it. Well, we have two that we're. <coughs> not actively using so if something happened we could use the other two no, so the two basins that were empty they did a startup on number three basin about last week so they are utilizing that one now so we are going to end up with one extra basin for future but the way those membranes work i mean they come in big cassettes so you'd almost have you have to pull that whole cassette out and replace that mm -hmm. cassette so our backup is not necessarily the membrane, but the entire system where the membrane's at. The uh, I mean, I, I think you could probably train. just shut off that one train. That one train in, well, that one membrane inside the train. Okay. Until you fix that one. So um, we do have, you know, five basins there, and there's a little bit of crossover. Um, so... Um, in terms of capacity, um, the big challenge would come in a really high flow event, and um, you know, those do happen on occasion. So, um, but just to kind of run down the list, um, uh, Mike got up with DHS Automation. They're the ones who repaired the electrical panel at lift station number two and put in the emergency, the portable emergency generator hookups, as well as doing the SCADA system programming to integrate it in the system. So those panels have been upgraded. But it's about 125 grand to do all of the other lift stations. So I broke it into two years' time. I mean, there's there's a kind of a phasing aspect to this. Um, we could do them all in the same year, but I'm uh, I thought I'd spread it out a little bit. And then we're going to have some other improvements that are needed on lift stations, pump rebuilds, those kind of things that come up. Um, the implant water system at the plant is um, defective. Um, so I threw in a hundred, or Mike gave me a swag at a hundred grand. So we're going to try to get that number refined. But this would be, for example, taking pumps and pumping effluent water that would be going to the golf course or the creek, and using it to wash the screens um, on the rotary screens, right? Or if we're trying to spray down the walls in the basins, it doesn't make sense to use potable water for that. That water isn't lost; it's just an internal circulation system. Belt press. The belt press uses that water as well. Are you saying that it's inoperative at the current time? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think it used to have like a pressure tank on it, like a well system and a private, you know, but that thing is defective. It's failed, and it was not a part of the w wastewater plant upgrade. Okay. In your spare parts inventory, does it include pumps for lift station? Um, I th no, this is for the plant itself. So, um, Are we talking lowers? Blowers? 
It's a fair point. Certainly, we, we've talked about that, and we're going to we, we have to go through. And I've got a parts list of if this fails, this system shuts down, and then we need to look at lead time. You know, is it something that's readily available, or is it something we really need to put in inventory? And wait. So um, you know, there's there's a long list of stuff to go through. But I mean, you, you, you're kind of rolling the dice, right? I mean, fifty thousand dollars is a lot, a lot of money, but I mean, who knows what? It, you could have a spare part that you think might be the critical piece, and then it could be something completely different. Right. We do. I, have I don't a, know. We do have a list um, from Kubota that says if this shuts down, this whole system shuts down. We've got a few of them that uh, mm. they're, they're critical to that base and operation. And um, so the important thing is to say, well, how long will it take to get one of these? If we can get it in a day or two, we can probably get by. If, we, if it's two months, now it's a totally different situation, and we need to think carefully about that. Yeah. And um, so it sounds like you're prioritizing not necessarily the things most likely to fail, but the things most difficult to replace. Yes. And it would be a key. Yeah, yeah, you have to integrate yeah. those two. Certainly, we're going to do things like you know uh, air filters. Um, yeah, standards. Know, those kind of things. Ought to, we ought to just have a bunch of them on the shelf. They're not that expensive. Uh, there are a few that are expensive, but we don't have one spare. It could be in any of the five basins, for example. And we can do N plus one rather than two N. Right. Right. Um, so moving on to fleet, um, we, you know, looking ahead, we, we're still anticipating our Vactor truck coming in um, here in the next month or two, I think. Um, we've been waiting for it for a while. Um, we've replaced a few vehicles this year, and so, um, but it turns out that our camera truck, which allows us to uh, run up inside of sewer systems and videotape, uh, is a, it's 16 years old, and the technology on it is pretty dated. Um, Mike tested out a system over behind Solana in the sewer line in question over there. It was pretty amazing. I mean, they ran the, the camera up there. It had a narrator like, uh, I forget the name of those Google Voice things, but it had a narrator saying how many feet up the pipe you were, it noticed where the lateral was, and those kind of things. So it provided, and a distance from the nearest manhole, so it can tell you, yeah, you got a problem at this point, it's 18 feet over here. It's a pretty neat system. Um, that truck is $210,000. Um, we would probably want to pay for that on a three-year lease purchase just to spread the cost out a little bit. Um, so I put that in there. Um, we've got one on-call truck for the water side of the house. And then in the second year, I put in a backup generator. That's a total swag. We're, we're going to get pricing on that. But if we're going to go through and put emergency connections for mobile generators on all of our lift stations, it certainly makes sense to uh, get a backup generator to have the most likely cause of a lift station failure is just loss of power. So, I have a question on a camera truck before you move beyond that point. Somewhere in the information I've looked at, uh, talking about capabilities downhole, uh, there's a system out there that apparently reads thickness of pipes and that type stuff. Uh, is that capability beyond what we need? That would probably be above, uh, beyond what we need. Actually, that camera truck that they come and demoed was probably over 400,000. Okay. We were just like, okay, well, we don't need all these bezel bells and whistles and all this stuff. It's like, you know, we need to be able to camera lines. We mm -hmm. want to put good information in there. It's a user-friendly system, so let's go yeah. it down to what worked for us. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, cameraing a line is one thing, but knowing how much uh, deterioration or leakage you have in the system is something else. That, that's actually much more important on concrete lines, steel pipe, uh, and sewers, because those, um, if the concrete goes away and the gases get into the, the reinforcing metal, it eats it. So I've seen those. I know Fort Worth was doing a lot of that type of work. Um, so they could do predictive failure, especially on their big mains. You don't want to, so they, when they fail, they turn into sinkholes. That's basically the challenge. Uh, in our case, we're mostly PVC pipe, uh, which For is For wastewater? Good. I understood we had some concrete tile. Right. We do have some clay tile. Or clay tile, I'm sorry. Yeah. In the old parts, we do. But for the most, I think probably, you know, well, one of the things we don't have is a really good inventory of what we have. <laughs> uh, but I think um, from what I've seen, it's mostly PVC. 
So is the actual cost of the truck $210,000? Well, that's a truck, but it's for the camera system and everything. Yeah, I mean, but the whole, if you walked in to this, wherever you would buy this and wanted to write a check today, tomorrow, would it be 210000 Because I was confused by the lease purchase reference. Well, and I didn't know how to spread it out on here. I just, I guess my message is looking ahead. We're not, we're not to a place where we can tell you about next year's budget yet, but um, we wanted to just kind of share one of the biggest impacts on that is capital purchases, both Pago capital and, you know, debt service is also an impact on overall system costs. I, I think there's a good story to hear to tell. Um, so let me get to the bottom line. The we, had, we swagged in some for fencing, but I think we need to do fencing improvements over the next five years about how much the budget on a given year probably change. And every year we would update this five-year CIP. That's important. Um, I've put in 30000 for GIS mapping, so it's a, an IT development, and um, also thirty five for developing an asset management program. Um, I don't think we have the staff capacity to really do that completely in-house. And in a lot of times when you're doing a software implementation, it's helpful to get outside help just to get through that critical mass and get it to where we can use it as a tool in our day-to-day -day work. Are we, are we looking for off-the-shelf or are we going to customize? Well, um, by their uh, by their nature, um, they are somewhat cu customized. I mean, it's a, so for example, in GIS, um, we would do it in Esri. They're 90% of the market share or more um, of the of the GIS software, but you have to go in and tell it where your assets are, what they're made of. I mean, it's effectively a, a graphic that has a database behind it. So, for, for the for the board, GIS is a geographic information sorry. system. For those that don't know, it's just a, and it's locating everything geographically. Yeah. With yeah. So where where are our 1,274 manholes. Um, we, we, we would go out there and actually GPS them and put them in the GIS layer, and then you know, they're fine. All right. All right. Our 811 project's not dependent on this, is it? No. Because I know we're going to try to get the Google image. Yeah, it looks, it looks to me like we can we can do that pretty easy. I just, I've, I've actually gotten to where I can figure in Google Earth how to create that shape file almost i just haven't got it done yet so we're going to enter that and i'm thinking it's not going to cost us much but um, i do think we really need to do that and it's i've got it later on my priority slide um our peak management software for agenda preparation and minutes um is um you know it's something we are a little bit behind on our implementation for that um, they offer um, a different package that allows you to so effectively, this new package exists in the cloud. Um, we can make agendas, we can post the minutes to the cloud, but they give you a HTML frame that you can display on your own web page so it looks like it's on our website, but somebody else does all the management. And it allows board members to do things like go into a draft agenda, write or an agenda, write their comments, we looked at the backup, these are the things I wanna bring up in the board meeting, do it on your own and then look at it on your computer. Um, so we've talked to some folks and our equipment here is pretty antiquated. Um, you know, it'd be really nice to do some improvements. We've heard that um, the Justin City Hall has been improved in such a way that allows them to take better advantage of that. Peak, which is a subset of Granica software, it's used by a lot of big cities, but it's the, it's the smaller version, if, if you will, it's more suitable for our size. Um, we would have to separately post our own video on a different web page for this board meeting, for example. Um, but our equipment as it exists wouldn't really support um, what they're doing. So I've thrown that in there. I think it's time to upgrade the, the camera views of you all sitting here uh, looking at me like, what the heck is he talking about? Um, you know, it's pretty hard to see your face and your expressions because this is old camera equipment. And there's been an incredible improvement in technology. <laughs> um, we pushed off a lot of the um, wastewater treatment plant security improvements, and that is also a swag. I, um, um, you know, I, we're going to have a more refined number when we push up the actual budget. But here's the key point, I think, for me, is that um, last year, our capital um, expenditure that went to Pago Capital, pulled out of pocket and spent that year, was on the order of $1.2 million. 
So this number, um, which may go up a little, is $763,000. So it's not going to drive a big change and might even you know, provide a little bit of extra um, flow to the reserve funds if we can figure out what our target is. We don't have any joint projects with the town for FY18-19? Yeah, I was going to ask no, about Okay, that. so um, if you look up there, the... I actually might have written that in the, the Meadowbrook Lane year. and Sundance Court is going to be a carryover this year. It was budgeted this year. It's going to be carried over into 19. They're going to do those in 19. And then I know they're going to start the Trophy Club Drive Durango in some time, some time frame of that, which we're not replacing any pipe there. We've got good new C900. But for their five year plan next year, they're doing Meadowbrook and Sundance. I think I've got it in the wrong column. Year. So it'll just be a carryover. Yeah, so that oh, should yes. be over to the left. So <coughs> instead of that 800 and 763, that yeah, it just be it just went up to almost. <laughs> 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 My so apology. But, but it was it was budgeted, so it gets to carry over. Yeah, so it'll it, just be a carryover. It, so it's it's already. If it was reserved, it would be carried over. So we're going to try to get this updated and then bring it back every year because every year it's going to change, right? We yep. have priority changes. I mean, you might say, well, we, we want to work on fences, but we can't do that one this year. It's going to have to wait another year. And that's, um, or we can't do all the lift station upgrades. They, you know, we have to phase them in. And so pick the ones that are the highest priority. I know a project that's not on here. Hmm? Lift station one access. Um, you're right. Um, you're right. I have it in this year's budget. Um, but um, yeah, okay. so we'll go back to it. I guess I could modify that here while, while we're standing here. But no, that's okay. I just I did put I just some engineering to think about for that because I figured by the time we got through engineering. Well, we're going to talk about some different stuff on that lift station too. It's one of our oldest ones. And it's really, uh, according to Mike, I have not been down in the vault. Um, it's the only one we have that does not have submersible pumps. So it has a dry well with pumps mounted down at the bottom of it that go through the wall. And then on the other side is, is kind of the manhole, if you will. It's a square poured concrete manhole, but that's, and we've got a lot of rust issues in there. Um, it's a confined space access challenge. Um, today, they, they almost never build a lift station like that. It's just, um, it's kind of dated technology and it may be time to design a change in that. Um, so that we can just get rid of um, confined space access at all there. See, I talked about that already. Okay, so um, I was asked to maybe just kind of give a, uh, my thoughts on uh, priorities, and I know you all have um, some of your own. Um, the, um, for me, uh, completion of design and construction of the, so I put it for the 18 to 24 month period. Um, getting that pipeline designed and in is going to be a great um, operation of the system improvement. Um, we're going to see a briefing on that again next Monday, and um, they've picked the final alignment. We we're sitting at my table, and we've got the drawing on the table, um, but um, we kind of found the optimal alignment to get through there. I really like to get an accurate GIS-based location and inventory of assets. So the typical way you do that is you say, here's manhole, you give it an asset number, Here's the next one, and the pipeline in between it is also an asset. And then the attributes of those assets, you can say the year it was installed, and was it made of? And maybe even last time you, you know, had replaced it, if it's a, if the asset's like a, a pump in a lift station. So, so is that a system that you buy, that you get, that, that, that does that? Um, yeah, so it's either software and development time, because you've got to put in all your assets. I mean, that's a, that's a big workload. But there are other ways to do it. There are people out there that come and do it for you, and then they will actually run the GIS layers on the cloud. And then you can take tablets or something that has Wi-Fi access to it, and pull it with the guys in the field or maybe working at night trying to find where's the upstream manhole. So we've got a, our sewers leaking on the ground. Where are we going to go? It's the middle of the night. It's dark out here. They can pull it up on a tablet and find it. And when was the last time this was clean? I mean, we, you know, those are important questions. And so the GIS system is really built for geospatially distributed assets. It's not going to be that helpful for, say, the water plant or the wastewater plant. Um, the, you know, but in terms of knowing what our assets are, um, our buried assets, our linear assets, it'd be really helpful. 
Um, the asset management is kind of a buzzword. It's almost like sustainability these days. You know, you can, it means whatever you want it to mean. But you know, to me, it's um, it's a it's a CMMS system, computerized maintenance management system that you go in. You have to get it started, but it issues work orders and it says, you know what, you're due for an oil change on that pump, or um, you need to get to this this month. Um, you know, those systems have kind of a startup energy. You got to put enough energy in it to get it useful for the people using the tool. Um, and I think we really need to get one of these in place. It's a, it's a critical thing. Um, you know, maybe more so for the wastewater plant than anywhere because we really don't have a structured maintenance program there. We're, we're starting to get there, but, um, you know, Mike's got a good system on the water side where, but it's programmed in, like the work orders come out of, the billing software of all things so they're not you can't put in a lot of um, what's the word advanced information about what the work order is if it's more than just go clean out a meter box or something like that i, I think i sent you a, a link to an asset management program called simple and i other than finding it i didn't do anything with it so there's a bunch of them out there. I, I found one that it. I like called Rhino. It's um, it's in the cloud. It's managed there, so we don't have to buy servers and do that kind of stuff. Um, it was kind of built for smaller systems. Ours doesn't need to be super complicated. Yeah. And it's been my experience that um, I've worked with several of them that they often have bells and whistles you just don't need. I mean, um, for us, especially for a system of our size. Um, like big inventory packages, for example, those running in Oracle, those are like nightmares. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I favor it uh, because two ways of running an operation, one of which is run to failure, which means Murphy's going to get you when you least expect it, and it's, he's going to cost you the most. And the other one is a managed system to where you know your, where your system's at and you can work them when it's convenient. So. What was the first one? Run to failure. Oh, run to failure. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, certainly one of my goals is to get us active in that 811 system, and that includes, um, you know, one of the things I worry about the most is that 21 inch line coming in. Um, you know, if there's a lot of construction going on around it right now, and, um, you know, and that's a lot of the space left for development. It's not too hard for somebody with a backhoe to knock out our water supply. And, um, you know, even if they had asked 811 for a ticket. Um, so, but the GIS shapefile can be drawn around it. Yeah. So we can include that and they would send us those requests as well. And, and that guy is outside of our district. Right, right. Um, I'd like to get them done with both the litigation on the Solana sewer line and the one that we just talked about in closed session. Um, I'm hopeful that we can get to a you know, we did uh, budget like over a three-year period, uh, 500 grand for the construction litigation. I'm hopeful that we don't have to spend that. And finally, um, I think we need to have a strategy for replacing uh, me. So that would be my priority. Um, so um, I'd like to hear a little bit from the board about what your goals and priorities are over the next 24 months. And then um, uh, Director Flynn had talked about um, a possible town hall meeting. So I've watched a few of those on TV. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of people would come. Maybe um, some people from across the road would come. But um, what, I don't know what you have in mind. So, um, And uh, any other parting thoughts? So I'll, I'll shut up now, and you guys can tell me what you think. Well, let me throw out why I, I thought about a town hall meeting. You know, the more people, as I was thinking about becoming a board member and maybe my fellow new members would, would agree, I mean, you, you're always running up to people in your neighborhood, at, a, at the golf course, at a bar, talking about the mud, throwing things out, whether it's cost, whether it's well, anything that might come up in the mud. And certainly anybody can come to a mud meeting. Right? We know that. Right? It's an open meeting. This meeting was open, and thank God my wife and mother-in-law came, so we were on the board. But the fact is nobody comes. And so why is that? It, it's not really too different from council meetings. If you go to council meetings, there's not a lot of people there either. That said, when they had the council meeting 
uh, about the roads. Uh, Carmen, I think you were there as well, and, and maybe Bill, you were there. There was probably 50, 60 people there. Now, you could say there were 50, 60 people there because that was going to impact their lives. True statement. Um, I, I just think as a new, we're the new board, and we've got two veterans and three newbies, I think the more we can communicate about what it is our goals are, to me personally, this was a very helpful meeting, very helpful. But the more we can communicate about what this MUD wants to accomplish, who we are, what do we want to do, listen to their concerns, I think in concept it's beneficial. Can we get people to show up? I guess that's another challenge. When we went to the um, session in August or, or a couple weeks ago, almost every speaker talked about, depending on the subject, having town hall meetings. Now, a lot of those were bond issue related discussions where people don't quite understand, but a lot of them talked about having town hall meetings and having people come and talking to them. I, I can't tell you how many speakers, how many breakouts I went to that they talked about that. I, I just feel that it's important given our history of where we were at the MUD, going all the way back to when we started with various MUDs and now we're down, to throw it out there and open it up and if we do a good enough job communicating about what it is and what we're hoping to accomplish, maybe it'll be beneficial. That just is my thought. Back to the question on where the directors are at. <clears throat> my goal for the MUD is to improve the operation. And I look at things like, we're a superior water district. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But there's a little guy called an outstanding water district. Why am I not, and what do I need to do to get there? We have, we're very open with our budgeting process, with our check register, and our finance, finances. The state treasury, treasurer has a award that goes to agencies that, in recognition of that status, the town gets it. I don't see why the mud doesn't get it. Maybe just a thing of, hey, here's where we are and what we do, and get that recognition. I would like to see as part of the budgeting process now and looking forward, and we can't get there this time, but I would like to see vision, mission, goals, and objectives. The board needs to talk about it. We need staff input on it. Everybody in the same canoe kind of going in the same direction. I would like to see a GFOA budgeting outstanding recognition from GFOA for our budget. That means a little bit of work and submission, but it also means that we have a good, solid format and presentation that's easy to us, easy to show to somebody and say, look, this is where we're at for budget. Uh, started that when I was on town council, we eventually got there. I think it's, it's a very strong indicator of how well your organization's operating. And I think we're quite capable of doing it. I'd also like to have the PAFR and the CAFR also awards, but those guys, those are downstream. If we can get a budget award, a recognition for the budget, and use some of those systems in our operation, we'll, it will be a little bit of work to, in the process, but once you get into that process, I think it simplifies things immensely. So those are some of the things, I mean, that I would like to do. Uh, I, al I also would like to do rebranding. I've got it on the, on the uh, next agenda. I think it's important that we do that if we're going to do it, that we do it soon because the staff will be getting new, once a year, new budget comes out, they go out and get new clothes for the year. And so if we're going to do a rebranding, we need to do it earlier than later so that it shows up this this cycle or ne you know in the next fiscal year so uh, that's just a thought on that uh, but those are those are some of the things that that I'm looking forward to 
Yeah, I'd say for me, I think we have, as a district, just simple blocking and tackling that we're not doing. And my, I guess, I'm, I'm not opposed to what you're saying, but I think that's a couple of years down the line. I think there are core competencies that we're just not simply doing. Uh, and rather than having staff spend their time trying to get a budget and award, I'd rather see them doing an asset management program, oh, sure. doing a GIS. Yes. And I think those things are going to consume in addition with the everyday work, given our staffing level will consume so much of their time that I don't think they're going to have time to do those things. I'm also a big believer in you can only do three or, mm, three or four things, three to five things. If you come up with 12 different priorities, you'll end up at the end of the year where you won't get anything done. And I'm more in favor of let's figure out the top three or four things, do that next year, focus on the next one, next year, focus on the next one. Uh, and then given our staff and where we are, uh, Carmen made a statement early about he's about keeping it simple. For me, I'm very much of the same mindset. I, it, I, the way I look at it is we're 19 people running a small water district. Uh, we don't need an Oracle database. Uh, we need to keep things small, keep them simple. Uh, we need it to be functional and work, not extravagant and looks real good with a lot of bells and whistles, but in reality, it doesn't work. Uh, so that's kind of my governing mantra. Let's focus on the basics. Let's make sure we're doing the things we have to get done, and then we can add the lettuce, tomatoes, and the, the, the garnish on the sides. But let's make sure our, maiden, our meat and potatoes are tight first before we start messing with the uh, garnish. I heard, you, I heard you took the lettuce off of here. Yeah, yes. no lettuce. <laughs> I, I got your lettuce just in case you want to add that later. That's that, that's Next a, year's budget. That's a, that, that's a honeymooner sandwich right there. Lettuce, lettuce alone. I need to maybe just make one small correction. Um, Stephen tells me we actually have 20 employees when we're staffed with all W-2 employees. Um, we're just not counting me in that process because I'm not a, I'm a contractor. 20, um, which is why when I say, you know, if you're going to pay a communication specialist, it's, um, you know, that's 5% of our ba basically work capacity. What are we going to spend that on? You know, can things like website editing be done by a contractor? It's maybe not core function to the district. And, um, you know, and, or can we get a couple of folks trained? You know, Lori's been doing a good job of editing our website, just getting stuff posted. Um, since Michelle's been away, but we've got some younger folks that might be able to take some classes and help with that aspect of what we do. So there's, you know, some other ways to go about that. But I thank you for that thought. It's, um, you know, getting the right tools so that folks can be more efficient. And um, to me, that's an important thing. And both the CMMS and GIS ideas yep. really go to the heart of that. Yep. I was just going to say, I agree with Greg. I think if you get too many priorities on there, you just get lost and you feel overwhelmed and, you know, nothing gets done. Um, and I think, you know, the past couple of years, the board has just been improving more and more, and I'm happy to be a part of this and look forward to working with town. <laughs> you pretty much said it all. I'm not sure I can. You want to put your mic down, Mark? No, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's, um, I guess that's all I have. Um, we're done a little bit early. Oh. Well, well, Carmen, you did a uh, absolutely fabulous job. Uh, a lot of hard work. Uh, I know the staff did a lot of work, but, you know, as a new board member, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you for all the work yeah. you did. Special thanks go out to you, Stephen, yep. and Lori for putting together this package. Uh, yep. Two years too late, but we're not going to bring that up. <laughs> oh. uh. <laughs> she's, she's not listening to me. She'll beat me up later. <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly we're you know we're anxious to help our board members get up to speed. You know, I um, when I first was a general manager out in Utah, I had C five board members, and my board chair had been there for eighteen years. And you know, when you get to talk to folks once a month, and you're dealing with complex projects, you know, they're usually busy business people that have other things to do, and it takes a long time to come up to speed. I mean. We were working on a dam project that 
a dam, like constructing a dam project with the Army Corps of Engineers. And it was 17 years in design. So, I mean, and approvals through all the environmental permitting. We get the construction, that's three to five years. And you know, our board chair had been there through the whole thing, right? So there's, there's um, th that becomes a, a challenge. Um, you know, it's hard for y'all to come up to speed. So we're, the staff is always happy to uh, sit down with you and explain things that, um, you know, maybe uh, we didn't explain correctly the first time and uh, make our time available to you uh, if you're interested. So I know, Mr. Chapman, I'd love to take you on a tour of the wastewater plant, let you have a look at what we're doing out there. Um, I've gotten every, everybody else out, so um, I, I think it's time for you and I to... Well, I'm not unfamiliar with wastewater treatment plants. I understand. I understand. you got some background, yeah. but... This membrane bioreactor is the biggest one in the state of Texas, and maybe the only one as of today. So, one of my first words was sludge when I was a kid. <laughs> Father. All right. Is there anything else? No, sir. Okay. Need a motion to call the meeting to adjourn. I guess move to adjourn. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. It's nine eighteen. The meeting is adjourned.